homelessness and recovery. I want to remind you that this public hearing is being recorded and broadcasted live on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, and Fios 964, and streamed on boston.gov backslash city council TV. I'd like to remind everyone to please silence your cell phones and other devices. We will also take public testimony and would appreciate it if you sign in to testify or to register your attendance. There is a sign in sheet near the door when you walked in if you're not a panelist. At the start of your testimony, I'd like to remind you to please state your name and your affiliation. Today's hearing is on docket 0245. This matter is sponsored by me, Councillor Murphy, and was referred to the Committee on Public Health, Homelessness and Recovery on February 2nd, 2022. So back in February, I had filed an order to address the youth and mental health crisis in our city. I don't have to read the whole order. I know many of you have already read it, and, but we do know that this is a very important issue. It always has been, but especially through COVID, we see the need that our youth have in the city of Boston right now. So I'm excited that we have so many panelists here. We have three panelists. The first will be the administration, those who work for the city of Boston. The second will be we have many mental health workers who are working with our youth across the city. And the third will be many nonprofits who have been out there with our children during this pandemic. So um, I'm not joined by any colleagues yet. I hope some do join us. Um, So um, I'm going to forego any opening statements because I would love to get right to the panelists. So the way this will go, um, we can start at this end and we can go down and just please remember to state your name and your affiliation. We will have about 20 minutes for the first panel. So if it gets a little long, I'll remind you it's time to move on. Does that sound good? Okay, great. So thank you very much, everyone. Good morning, Chairperson Murphy. Um, my name is Peter Rumpelakis. I serve as the Director of Child and Adolescent Mental Health for the Boston Public Health Commission. And I want to thank you for bringing us together today to talk about this important topic. As the COVID pandemic rages across the country, we need to address the impact that um, the pandemic and uh, the isolation that is brought has, has uh, having on youth and the trauma that young people are experiencing. Youth continue to face isolation, fear, uncertainty, stress, loss of loved ones, and more as the pandemic continues. Our youth were already facing mental, challenge, mental health challenges. The pandemic has exacerbated many of these. At the Boston Public Health Commission, promoting mental health and creating equal opportunities to ensure that youth have access to high quality, affordable, and culturally competent mental health care is part of our larger mission to protect, preserve, and promote the health of all Boston residents, especially those who are most vulnerable. The Boston Public Health Commission provides a variety of services and resources to improve the social, emotional, and wellness of all Boston residents, starting at an early age. The goal across all BPHC mental health initiatives is to build resilience and mental, health and mental wellness, reduce stigma associated with mental health issues, and support all Boston residents with robust services and resources that meet their unique needs. We work to support youth mental health through several programs, which I will uh, briefly describe. Our programs primarily offered through the Bureau of Child, Adolescent, and Family Health provide direct services, collaborate with Boston Public Schools to ensure that youth have support in schools and address the different social determinants of health that are impacting youth mental health. Uh, I'll, I'll go in kind of uh, developmental age. Uh, early childhood mental health promotes service delivery using the evidence-informed launch and my child model with a family partner and clinician team. From 2019 to 2023, we are working with Department of Children and Families and Children's Services of Roxbury to focus on identifying and meeting mental health needs of children uh, from age zero to 48 months and their families. Uh, healthy Baby, Healthy Child program is our nursing or community health worker team assess 
for depression on our assessments when meeting with families using the Center of, for Epidemiology Studies, CESD. Short-term therapy, three to six months, is provided for our, by our social workers, and if long-term treatment is needed, we refer out to mental health agency. This is open to anyone referred into the program who is from Boston. Boston Healthy Starts Initiative. Our family partners use the same scale and will refer to our behavioral health clinician for individual therapy. There's also a postpartum support group that runs for eight weeks to support mothers up to eight weeks postpartum. This program targets self-identified black women with a baby up to the age of 18 months. School-based health centers, which is my personal program, uh, we have continued to work with Boston Public Schools to automatically have students enrolled, where that's a, a process right now. It works on parental consent um, to sign in to become a member of the health center. Uh, once they've become members of the health center, the student themselves can opt into all services, comprehensive health services offered in the health centers, but mental health is uh, one of them. So a student could opt to seek services uh, on their own. Um, we have many referrals from within the school, from school staff, but also from peers and from individuals themselves and from families. Um, our mental health services are differentiated from BPS school social workers in that our only role is to provide high quality clinical care in a confidential setting. We are differentiated from other school-based me mental health providers, both for profit and nonprofit, in that our services are completely free to the student and family and are not reliant on insurance. Uh, in fiscal year 22, uh, there have been 3,367 uh, visits and 1,779 students enrolled in our program. Uh, health resource centers, which are also school-based program, uh, 60, 654 students received in-class health education, 2,061 students were reached via outreach events, and 604 students did in-office visits. HRC teaches the Breaking Free from Depression curriculum developed at Children's Hospital and has reached 379 students to, in eight uh, Boston Public High Schools. Uh, our capacity building and training initiative, 115 youth engage in trauma-informed trainings and workshops. Youth peer leaders were engaged in workshops on mental health, wellness, and positive identity. Our neighborhood trauma team uses shared approaches to respond to incidents of community violence in a collaborative manner to facilitate the recovery of individuals, their families, friends, and communities from traumatic exposure. Currently, there are six neighborhood-based teams, Bowdoin, G Geneva, Four Corners, East Boston, Jamaica Plain, Mattapan, Roxbury, Grove Hall. Services available in multi-languages, all interactions with team members are confidential and voluntary. And finally, community prevention services uh, through our substance uh, prevention programs. In addressing substance misuse, misuse and abuse, we are enhancing and reinforcing positive coping skills amongst youth, building capacity across the city of Boston with community partners and schools to address substance use, and educating youth about the impacts of substance use through workshops. We also strengthen youth, violent, uh, youth voice in determining ways to address adolescent substance misuse through our Youth Advisory Board. Uh, so far, it's a fairly new program. Um, 59 providers have been trained, uh, 149 youth have received workshops, and there, um, a youth provider of workshops training, a peer-led peer group, uh, there are six. Um, that is kind of the frontal face of what we've been doing. Uh, there's many, uh, I'll address, uh, Later, there's much more to come, and there's much more going on behind the scenes. Um, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about what are the unmet needs. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. So uh, primarily, mental health uh, providers serving Boston children and youth have been struggling to fully staff their clinical positions, uh, including, including my own. I've had two vacancies for um, about a year. Uh, the labor demand is greater than the supply, especially when we are seeking culturally and linguistically appropriate staff. Salary scales have fallen below market value, and we need to address this to provide our youth with the well-trained, culturally relevant, and committed therapists that they deserve. I also like to say that mental health is not addressed and just addressed in the clinical hour. 
Any actions that positively impact the oppressive forces of poverty, racism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and xenophobia also reduce the stress and cultural gaslighting to which our youth are subjected. We must scaffold around them arts, theater, music, dance, athletics, poetry, STEM clubs, etc., all of which offer community, skill building, and positive identity formation for young people whose entire development has been put on hold for the better part of two years. Again, I want to note that the work in my office I, that I've discussed here today is part of a larger network of programs at BPHC and other city agencies that serve the behavioral health needs of youth in Boston, including trauma response and services to address the needs of individuals experiencing homelessness and substance use disorders. In recognition of the urgent demand to enhance Boston's response to the crisis level behavior health needs, you will be hearing more in the coming weeks about new investments at BPHC to scale up innovative behavioral health prevention and response models through a comprehensive and coordinated citywide response. In closing, thank you uh, to the Com Committee on Public Health, Homelessness, and Recovery, and to you, Chairperson Murphy, thank you. Uh, for allowing me the opportunity to testify today, and I am happy to answer any questions in, during the Q&A session. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jenna Parafinzik, Boston Public Schools. Good morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak. My name is Jenna Parafinzik, and I'm grateful to be here and share our work in BPS to advance mental health healing. I come before you fully cognizant that I'm a white woman who has the honor of serving predominantly black, Latinx, and immigrant student population. And I do so proudly presenting on behalf of two Latina leaders, Elich Nayeli Tabora, our Assistant Superintendent of Department of Student and Community Impact, who is currently working on important changes right at this moment to bolster our Office of Social Work, and Carmen Calderon O'Hara, who is the Director of Social Work, who is on leave. I bring you the knowledge and experience of a school-based social worker within the Boston Public Schools for the past 16 years, and a current transformation social worker at the Dearborn STEM Academy, and also as the Acting Director of Social Work. While the entire city of Boston works together from to recover from the effects of the pandemics, the Boston Public Schools has reinforced our commitment to create safe, healthy, welcoming, joyful, culturally and linguistically sustaining school environments that coupled with rigorous, culturally relevant pedagogy allow students to critically engage with the world and to transform it. To address health disparities that can, dress, that can disrupt learning, BPS takes a whole school, whole community, whole child approach guided by our district wellness policy to make sure students have the opportunities, services, and support to be healthy now and for their lifetime. Every member of the BPS community plays a role in supporting the health and wellness of our students, partnerships with families, city and community agencies are essential. In the past several years, BPS has invested 25.5 million in social workers, family liaisons, nurses, and school psychologists, allowing us to expand student access to mental health services and increase staff racial and linguistic diversity, shared with you on Monday. We've increased the number of social workers this year by 108, and we'll be adding 26 more school psychologists, increasing the number of school counselors and mentors, all of whom will coordinate comprehensive asset-based student plans. Both students and staff have experienced a wide range of experiences, including trauma, stress, and loss. It's essential that all schools are prepared to support communities through healing-centered engagement. Our teams provide a multitude of mental health services to students, including but not limited to community, community building and healing circles, individual and group counseling, referrals to community partners, completion of risk assessments, and to date our collective mental health staff have completed 850 plus suicide risk assessments and over 200 threat assessments. Mm. Across the district, crisis response teams supported by the Office of Social Work, Safety Services, and Behavioral Health Services have supported 66 high-impact crises along across 43 schools supported by 184 mental health staff. Our crisis work is done in collaboration with various BP, BPS offices, city departments, and community agencies to support neighborhood healing. 
We strive to include youth voice in our work of destigmatizing and increasing mental health access for our students. There are two main advisory boards that serve as a vehicle for youth engagement, empowering teens through health and Boston Student Advisory Council, BSAC. BSAC has held town halls with mental health as a major focal point, and thanks to their advocacy is a large uh, reason we have a clinician on call during VPS vacations and during the summer. We've heard the council's inquiries as to how we're supporting our staff through the pandemic, and we agree. It is critically important to invest in the care of our educators and staff. Above and beyond the standard employee resources, BPS offerings include staff support during crisis response, partnering with the Boston Public Health Commission's Office of Public Health Preparedness to provide community stabilization, staff self-care offerings, staff healing circles supported by our Office of Restorative Justice in partnership with social workers, other staff, and the BTU. Wellness initiatives in over 30 schools, targeted professional development related to trauma and stress reduction, and workplace well-being and stress management training for bowling staff. We recognize the importance of collaboration within our resource-rich resource city. To that end, BPS participates in hub tables that advance cross-departmental coordination efforts. Our Behavioral Health Services Office leads the Boston School-Based Behavioral Health Collaborative and has over 20 partners within schools. While there's certainly a great deal of work to do for our, our entire city to overcome the challenges we are facing, BPS continues working collaboratively to mitigate the impacts of this mental health crisis, and we thank you, the Council, for your support and partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just introduce myself. Um, yes, please. Uh, I'm Jill Carter. I'm the Senior Executive Director for the Office of Health and Wellness. And the Office of Health and Wellness has four teams um, that includes the work of social emotional learning, health education, physical education and physical activity, and um, the wellness, wellness policy promotions and evaluations. And so our office is. Uh, here to uh, answer any questions if, if there's anything that falls into those categories. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate that. Hi. <coughs> Good morning, Chairperson Murphy. My name is Maria Cheevers, and I'm the Director of the Boston Police Department's Office of Research and Development. And I, hear, I have here today with me my Deputy Director, Jenna Savage, who will be available along with me to answer questions after um, our time and the Q&A comes up. <clears throat> Today I'm here to speak about the many BPD programs, initiatives, and partnerships that the Boston Police has developed over 25 years to support the mental health and emotional and social development of our youth. I will start with the program model that has operated out of the department for now over 12 years in partnership with the, medical, the Boston Medical Center, and I will continue on with our hub initiative in five neighborhoods a Shannon Grant program and the Safe and S Successful Youth Initiative and multiple neighborhood-based youth-focused partnership efforts. The BEST co-response program is a BPD partnership with Boston Medical Center's Boston Emergency Services team. It's called BEST. There are five efforts specifically um, or tangentially taking place at the same time that is um, focused on mental health, specifically of youth. Um, they fall under the categories, again, of co-response, research, training, and an initiative called the Se Sequential Intercept Mapping Initiative, which is citywide, as well as, again, I'll continue forth with the hub model. The co-response program peers BPD offices with master's level mental health clinicians to help improve outcomes to mental health related calls for service and also provide follow-up. BPD offices and clinicians connect youth and families in the community to the BEST mobile team to offer intervention, stabilization, connection to ongoing behavioral health care without needing to access the emergency department. BPD currently has 12 BEST clinicians co-responding to mental health related calls for service, including at least one clinician per district except for two, uh, E13, which is, will be hired and two clinicians specifically assigned to the city street outreach unit. Currently, there are three vacant best clinician positions that we are actively seeking to fill. 
One, blessed, one best clinician was initially dedicated to co-responding with BPD school with the, with the BPD school police unit. The BPD school police unit consists of officers and a supervisor who has been specifically trained on juvenile me mental health. The clinician that worked with him was hired in April of 2019 and left his position in January of 2022. During that time, the Massachusetts police reform legislation came out, uh, or I should say during the same time, which resulted in the elimination of 75 special police officers assigned to the Boston Public Schools. These officers responded to youth who struggled with behavioral outbursts resulting in de-escalation of incidents and thus avoiding the need for Boston police presence in those schools. As you may know, this legislation left it up to school superintendents as to whether or not to hire school resource officers. Boston is the only district in the Commonwealth that has opted not to reinstate SROs. At the same time, police presence in schools has also become significantly limited due to post legislation. For these reasons, we've decided not to refill the BPD SPU best clinical position as the clinician had, had been underutilized while assigned to BPD offices after the legislation came out. Instead, our goal is now to ensure that neighborhood-based districts are fully staffed with clinicians during the day shift so that district offices are more likely to co-respond in calls for services with, bless, with best clinicians to these schools. Beyond that, there is also a research project that is taking place um, and the BPD is actively involved with it in, in partnership with Boston University, UMass Lowell, and Boston Public Schools to examine police response to mental health crises in schools via 911 calls to, for service, which are generated from BPS addresses. The partnership has already examined the 2017-2018 school year, and we are now currently working on examining 2018 through 221 school years. This research will enable us to examine the impacts of both COVID-19 pandemic and the disbandment of the Boston Public School Police Units on schools reliance on BPD for behavioral health related issues. Boston Police Department also participates in regular meetings of the Youth Mental Health and Crisis Intervention Coalition, which includes representatives from the Boston Public Schools, BMC, Boston University, BEST, UMass and UMass Lowell and facilitates collaboration and information sharing across these agencies in an effort to address challenges related to youth mental health in Boston. And under the category of training, the Boston Police Department Street Outreach Unit in conjunction with the Boston Police Academy has received Department of Mental Health grant funds enabling the BPD to become a crisis intervention training and technical assistance center and we'll be convening our first two inaugural 40-hour crisis CI2 trainings this month. This 40-hour training focuses heavily on de-escalation skills and educating offices about community-based resources and partners. It includes specific modules on youth mental health, DCF-related issues, DYS slash JDAI, um, youth mental health from the family perspective and trauma. A fourth effort is the Sequential Intercept Mapping Initiative. Finally, for many years now, the BPD has been helping to lead the City of Boston Sequential Intercept map Mapping efforts as part of the Mass Trial Court's Community Justice Project. S several such mapping workshops have taken place over the years, bringing various stakeholders and partners together to collaboratively identify local resources and gaps in services and create an action plan to enhance collaboration and reduce the risk of justice involved and justice involvement and recidivism for young people with addiction and or mental illness. The plan since the beginning of the project has always been to conduct a mapping specifically focused on juveniles. Given the current crisis, the BBD will be working with its community justice project steering committee to spearhead the launch of a juvenile mapping in the coming year enabling us to identify the most pressing gaps in serving this population and then begin taking action to fill those gaps. Uh, I, I don't know how much time I have left, but I have one more model and I will sure, go quickly. You can do it, um, thank you. The Boston Police Department's hub model was launched in 2018 as a partnership with Mass Housing and the East Boston Community Health Center. 
with now up to 125 additional community-based organizations involved in four police districts, East Boston, JP, Dorchester, and Roxbury, who each convene weekly with up to 30 community-based organizations to identify families and youth in crisis and to provide for them comprehensive resources, including mental health and emotional health services. To date, the hub has received 417 referrals, of which 65% of those families and youth have been connected to services. 12% could not be located, 10% were informed of services, and 5% um, refused support. I want to take this time to thank you for convening this hearing, and um, again, any questions, we're, we're here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I want to acknowledge that um, my colleague, Councillor Rorell, has joined us. And if you would like to start, would you like to start with some questions for the first panel? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And thank, um, you thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for leading on this <laughs> important issue. Um, and thank you to the panel for all your work in the city of Boston with our, with our young people. Um, do we have any findings on what are the leading stressors you know, for our young people? And anyone can answer those, yeah. Thank you. Um, for what we see, we see um, a lot of loss, a lot of trauma, uh, and stressors due to acculturation. Uh, many, we are a gateway city, and so we, um, we see a lot of new arrivals uh, in our services. I'm from the Boston, I'm, don't, I, I think you missed my test, I'm from the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, so those are, those are the three main things, but over the pandemic, certainly the issues of loss and trauma have, have certainly been at the top. Thank you. And um, I find peer-to-peer -peer support models to be very effective and impactful. Um, what type of trainings or, um, trainings, um, or initiatives that we're doing as a city to equip our young people to help identify amongst their peers those who are going through uh, mental health issues or have sui suicidal thoughts? So uh, for our programs, we have many uh, peer-led youth programs, uh, Peer Leadership Institute, um, uh, Start Strong, which is de uh, focused on uh, dating violence and healthy, healthy relationships. Uh, with, with teens. Um, these are all peer-led uh, workshops. Um, we are always looking to expand our peer-led programming. Uh, we d our health resource centers do uh, Breaking Free from Depression, which does have a peer uh, component to it. Um, and that, that's in eight high schools. And if any other panelist wants to answer, if you just press the button, they'll make sure the mic turns on, so please feel free to just, press, yeah, yeah, please do. It will start as soon as you press, yeah. I, I, I'm from the Boston Public Schools Office of Health and Wellness, and I just wanted to add a, a few, um, an, a few examples of initiatives. So we do have a youth advisory board. Um, it, one of them, we have several, but one is uh, the, uh, the youth advisory board called Empowering Teens Through Health. And that's a group of students who, it's, it's not directed at peer mentoring, but it's more directed at youth recognizing what are the issues that are, are important to them, and then creating um, campaigns, if you will, promotional, health promotional campaigns, and that group has identified um, mental health, uh, you wouldn't be surprised, as an area that they want to work on. So that is one example of engagement. Um, we, we also feel that, um, Health education, which is intended for all of our students, is designed to build the skills that we would want for students to be able to work, uh, to, to think about themselves and their own health, but also to recognize need across um, their students, or their friends, and their families. So um, we're really trying to in increase the amount of health education that is inclusive of emotional health education um, in our schools. And I'll pause and see if others have a question. Yes, go ahead, Presley. I'd like to first address your question of what's causing a lot of stress. I think that family violence um, originates and, and pours into community violence. And when young people are exposed to violence in the home and then violence in the community, 
there's a lot of fear and a lot of stress. And then I think secondly, you know, we're from a generation, as I am at least, that we were out all day playing with our friends. And, you know, since the introduction of the phone and, and parents giving kids phones, and, and I did it, um, in social media, isolation and, and, and depression, I, I think, kicks in. And so between family violence and, so, and, and isolation caused by, I think, social media, we have a lot of stressors that young people have now that we may not have had as acutely when we were um, coming up. Uh, with regard to your question, um, we have a Bureau of Community Engagement. We have a GROW program, which is specifically for girls. And it is a community-based girl, girls mentorship program, um, which creates community amongst and between young women, which is important uh, these days. The program specifically focuses on inner city young girls ages nine to 14. It promotes self-esteem building, leadership building, problem solving development, interpersonal development, growth and mentorship. The goal is to teach, inspire, and support young girls throughout the city as they transition into adulthood. We have a number of other programs, but I don't wanna overstay my time. But if you're interested in a more complete list, we can certainly get that to you. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. Yes. Um, yes, all my questions. Please. Thank you, Madam Okay, Chair. thank you. And we've been joined by Councilor Mejia. Welcome, how are you? Thank you. Thank you. And um, yeah, you can say hello. And the first panel, just so you know, is um, the administration. So we had the public health, the public schools, and the Boston police. So you can jump right in. Thank you. Really incredibly encouraged by your leadership on all things mental health and wellness. So really happy. I was not going to miss this for the world. So happy to be here. And um, I had someone from my team listening in. So just so you know, even though I wasn't here, I did have ears in here. Um, <laughs> but I know many of you. Peter, it's great to see you. Um, you o oversaw the Youth Development Network. Um, for the last 10 or eight, eight to 10 years that I was a part of working in deep community with you and the, and the students who were chronically absent in Boston Public Schools and all the amazing work that you did to support um, their, who's playing with my mic? Huang, don't play with my mic. Um, all the work that you uh, did to support. Um, and we actually worked on a PSA series that helped um, Boston Public Schools understand why um, so many of our students who were chronically absent, what were the issues that they were dealing with in terms of their social and emotional and mental well-being? Because we can't talk about um, the work that Boston Public Schools have to do without really understanding the needs that young people are experiencing um, in their schools and out on these streets. So thank you, Peter, for, for your leadership and your partnership in that space. Um, I guess some of my questions for the administration, and you already know that this is a, something that is dear and near to me. Um, so, you know, mental health is really intersectional, right? So we really can't talk about mental health without talking about housing insecurity, um, food insecurity, um, substance use disorder, et cetera, that all of these things are interconnected. And oftentimes I say, how do you eat an elephant? It's one piece at a time. How do you deal with one issue? It's one issue at a time, but when you're a young person and you're dealing with all of these things, all at once, or you're living in a household that is, it is a lot. And then you have to go to school and show up and be your best self. So I'm just curious if you could just talk to us, what are we doing as a city um, to look at housing, particularly housing for young people for 19 to 24 year olds? These are young people who I'm looking to hear a little bit more about um, who are aging out of DYS, um, aging out of foster care, so I'm just gonna ask you all to talk to me specifically around that um, issue. And then continuing with my question around the intersectionality around mental health and wellness um, and the ways that we intersect um, and accept young people's identity. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, students, you know, just being black, Latinx, an immigrant, LGBTQ, all those intersectionalities really do impact how you show up in this world. So if you could just talk to me a little bit about what BPS or the administration and um, the folks who are here are doing to kind of like 
interweave the intersectionality around um, the different identities. And can you just talk a little bit more about the neighborhood trauma teams? Um, I think you mentioned this earlier. Um, is the team reflective of the communities that you serve? Especially with the low wages that the city of Boston pays, you can't even afford to live here in the city, let alone serve people here. So I'm just curious how you all are contending with that um, issue here, uh, people who who are living the realities are often um, the least paid. So I'm just curious like how you all are dealing with that. I have a lot of questions, sorry. Um, and if you could just tell me what you are doing specifically around when trauma occurs in our neighborhoods, what's the response um, in terms of communi uh, community engagement and communication? Um, I know that we usually focus a lot of our energy on the initial support for the, the families. I'm curious about the vicarious trauma and what does that look like for the neighbors and, and the small businesses and just the community as a whole? Like, what are we doing? And I only have seven minutes, so that's enough for now. Go. <laughs> yeah, I can, um, I can take a little bit of the first question around um, the, the homelessness um, resources, and I will say that I'm um, sort of repeating um, some of the elements that um, Brian Marks, our Senior Director of Opportunity Youth, um, brought up at our hearing on Monday, and I don't want to pretend that I can speak to this at the level that he at would, but just in terms of um, for, the, for the efforts to remove barriers and uh, expand learning opportunities and provide enhanced support services that are essential to meet uh, the most Jill, vulnerable. Yep. I need you, don't read. I just need you to really add, like speak from your heart. Okay, okay well, please, this, I'm I, gonna ask you because it, it helps me follow and track. And right now, I know he's not here to answer, right. so that's okay. So you want me to, do, so, so I, I will tell you there's an increased investments yes, that's in, what I um, in um, homelessness uh, education resources. Awesome. And um, there, it's, it's about 4.5 million um, is the increased investments, and this relates to housing vouchers, emergency homelessness prevention assistance, and school-based investments. So that's a hopefully quick summary. Well, don't you feel better that you did that? I'm here to take care of your mental health and wellness, so you know. Okay. I really appreciate it. Okay, okay. So can someone talk to me a little bit about um, some of the trauma and their response? Because that is definitely something that is really big in, in our neighborhoods. And somebody, you were talking about violence, right? And that whole idea of living in fear, it is real. Like when I go to the bodega with my daughter, the first thing that I do before she goes out is I say, let me look to see if there's anything happening. And if there's nothing happening, then we can go. The barber shop and the hair salon where we go, somebody was murdered in their chair. So this is the reality that we're living in. And so kind of just talk to me a little bit about that whole fear factor and how that plays up the way people are showing up. So, I, I, you asked specifically about the neighborhood trauma teams. Yep. Um, so that's under the commission. And uh, the, so it is a network that marries both what's happening. So if a victim is brought to the hospital, it's, it, it may be initiated there or it may be initiated from the community. Uh, it's, it's a multi-level where there's a community part, each area has a community partner that knows the community. Uh, it, it's, it could be a nonprofit, it could be a community center, it could be uh, a community uh, health center. Uh, so that becomes the hub of the response for that area. Uh, sometimes they'll do door to door to, to see who's impacted to give them information about trauma and where to seek uh, support. Um, sometimes they'll run groups within the, uh, for impacted individuals within the community. They will address the family, they will, um, so it's, it's a partnership between a clinical provider, a community-based uh, organization, and then it's a network. And if it, and if it I, will, I will get, if it involves a, a, a young person uh, who's in Boston Public Schools, I'll usually get that, and, and BPS will also get that alarm so we can coordinate how we're responding to the school communities within the walls of the schools. Jenna Parafinze, Acting Director of Social Work for the Boston Public Schools, thanks for having us. Um, our coordination within the school uh, department is uh, led by the Office of Social Work and the Office of Safety Services, supported by uh, the Depart uh, Behavioral Health Services. We have a 
team of leads that uh, get information, share, and decide how we'll um, deploy our resources or what the need is. So as far as uh, if there's a high impact uh, uh, trauma that happens in a community or near a school community, uh, we will get the information, we will connect with the school community and ask them what they need. Uh, we often um, times in the past have just run in and decided what they need, so we try to work with the school to make sure we are uh, supporting as the school uh, community needs and utilizing city agencies to partner to make sure uh, we're not just going in for you know a day and then leaving, so that we're making sure we have wraparound services to uh, that continue uh, for healing at, at, in the neighborhood and in the school. Can you tell me your name? Because on my document here, I don't. I, I see Jill, Peter, Maria, Malta, and Kate. Are you? That was not one of them. Okay. Um, so can you um, tell me again your name? Sure, Jenna Parafinzik. I'm uh, the acting director, and I'm speaking on behalf of Elich Nayale Tora, okay. and I am uh, also the transformation social worker at the Dearborn STEM Academy. Okay, great. But I'm curious too. I mean, and I know that we're going to be blessed with um, Tina Cherry's presence in a little while. But there is an amazing book um, uh, and a book of poems and. There's been a lot of initiatives with nonprofit organizations, and I'm just curious, like the role that nonprofit organizations play in terms of providing content um, and curricula that could be useful to the schools. So I'm just curious about what those partnerships look like and what opportunities exist. I know Toy also does a lot of work around um, suicide prevention, so I'm just curious about how BPS is utilizing the wisdom and and the uh, genius that we have in our communities to help support some of your work. Uh, I would say we can do better to collaborate. I've heard you say, I was here on Monday, I've heard you say we're a resource rich city and we don't uh, collaborate as well as we can. I take that, I even put it in my opening remarks because uh, we take that uh, seriously and we are committed to doing better and making sure we know that all of the people in this room want to support kids and we want that too. Yeah, and before I get the, uh, well, so I don't hear the, oh, yeah, well, well, how are you doing this? You're getting chair. like two more minutes. Oh, wow. And then it will be my turn. Okay, I'm let gonna find let the, out. Yeah, I got I'm going to let everyone time. answer the question. That's why I'm glad it's just us here, because yeah. I'm going to be all here for until the next three days. No. Um, but thank you, Chair, for, for, for giving me this much time. Um, I do want to lean in a little bit more around the coordination piece, because absolutely, Boston is resource rich and coordination poor. We have so many resources, so many organizations who are actually doing the work. But what we have yet to do is to figure out how do we collaborate in ways that are really going to address, right? Because what happens when we don't do that, we do this. That was so and so I was supposed to do it, that was, and we don't get anywhere, right? And I think that as we start talking about the coordination piece, which is why I'm really excited about some of the work that my colleague, um, Council Rorel, is doing around a tracking system, um, and also other, other colleagues here, is that we are going to have to get to the point in terms of accountability and transparency that we are holding ourselves accountable to that process because not one organization is gonna be able to do it alone. Boston Public Schools is not gonna be able to do it alone. BPD is not gonna be able to solve homicides alone. Like We're gonna to have to recognize that it's gonna take all of us working across all of our differences, right, um, to, to address this issue because if not, it's just gonna be more blah, blah, blah. I, I didn't see Malta Rivera here, so I'm going to assume that, is there someone here from um, the Boston Youth and Family Center that is gonna be speaking to us? At some point, showed up. No. No. Okay. Um, because I do believe that they also play a central, uh, central role mm -hmm. um, in, in this, uh, in this conversation. Um, can you just talk to me? No one really addressed this, and I still would like to know a little bit about the intersectionality around the identity piece and how our kids are showing up and how we're we supporting the intersectionality around all of the, the race, the gender, the everything. Jill. Yes. Well, first I just wanted to comment on. Um, that coordination piece, if I could. Um, we have a, um, we've had for more than 10 years now um, a stakeholder group called the District Wellness Council. It's a superintendent appointed um, committee. It's led by myself and always has been from someone from the Boston Public Health Commission. Currently it's PJ McCann, um, their uh, deputy of policy. 
Um, and it is made up of um, fo families, uh, students, um, central office staff that lead key departments, including social work and behavioral health services and health services, um, and as well as school level staff, and does have community partners on it, like Children's Hospital. Um, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm losing train of thought, but I wanted you, as well as other, like BARC and other community okay. partners. So I just want to say that, and we have subcommittees of eight parts of the policy and lots of people working across agencies and community partners there. So I'll stop with that, but I just wanted to say that has been established. And then the intersectionality part, I didn't get to come up, but and I see the gavel, but I'm happy to talk about some of the um, work we're doing around making sure you brought up LGBTQ youth are considered in and that. And immigrant and undocumented. Yep. Yep. I mean, like our kids are carrying multiple layers. They're not just bringing oneself. There's a lot. And they're also living in homes, right, where they're not being affirmed or, or supported. And our parents, you know, we're dealing with our own drama and our own trauma, right? And so how are we looking at this issue, it's not just about youth mental health, it's understanding that this is a family issue, and it, it, as you all continue with your work, is really looking at this as the whole child, the whole family, the whole community, because it's all of us. And I got the gavel, and I will um, follow up with some other questions whenever yes, well, the chair you. gives me the opportunity to do so. No, thank you. thank you, and thank you for those questions. Um, I would just like to say also that we know that the mental health challenges that our children were facing before the pandemic were of great concern and COVID-19 has only intensified these concerns and it continues to take an alarming toll on our youth. We all know the statistics. Many of you have shared some of these statistics, right? And also one of the reasons I wanted to make sure we have so many panelists here from different organizations, not just from the administration, is because we know it's not just the schools dealing with it or the police or the public health commission that we know families, caregivers, schools, but also community centers, faith-based organizations, health centers, hospitals, they're all caring for our young people. And there's such soaring rates of depression, anxiety, trauma, loneliness, and suicide that will have lasting impacts on them. I mean, we don't even know, right? It could be generations that this is going to continue. So we really need to be proactive and address these issues. And it's one, you know, I call this hearing because I want to make sure that we discuss progress towards ensuring that every child has access to high quality, affordable, and culturally competent mental health care. That we put supports in place for the mental health of our children in schools, but also in community and child care settings. That we sustain funding for effective school-based mental health care and address the economic and social barriers that contribute to the lack of mental health for our young people. Discuss increased funding for evidence-based mental health screening, diagnosis, and treatment, particularly for underprivileged populations. And we have to strengthen suicide prevention programs in school, primary care, and community responses. We know that the suicide rates are increasing at alarming rates. So that is one of the reasons also I wanted to make sure we held this hearing now is we're in the middle of budget season that we as the council, we are all saying that this is important to us but we have to make sure that we value it in a way when we're advocating for the budget in funds and places. My question um, for this first panel before you move on is what needs do you see new that are, you're unable to keep up with? Like I said, you've already and have always been working in this field with kids struggling, but this pandemic has really brought up new things. So if you could touch on anything you see new that you're unable to support, and what is the like most startling concern you see our youth struggling with? I often say, um, you know, I'm not the expert in everything, so I'm grateful that you're here and that we have people and there'll be more panelists speaking that are in the neighborhoods working with our children from all across the city. You, you know, so you know better than I do, like what can we do or need to do to address these needs? So if any, if all of you could just touch on, you know, especially like in the schools, what you see with the police outreach or the need you've already mentioned. We know there's a staffing shortage, but uh, there are certain concerns that are really startling that you just didn't think were gonna happen through this pandemic. Um, so 
the real struggle we see with teens is that the, when your environment and your developmental needs are at odds with each other, that's, that's uh, psychogenic, that's, that creates mental health issues. And for teens whose development calls for them to be with their peers and they've been shuttered in their homes for uh, two years, uh, certainly that has had a, a great Im impact. Uh, I want to reemphasize the need for programming that is not, has no pathology intent behind it. Programming that offers arts, that offers theater, that offers these um, experiences for youth to have a healthy identity formation uh, that allows for them to um, explore community and to, to have a different sense of themselves other than their grades at school uh, or their role at home. Um, so I, I would want to see us expanding those services or at least connecting uh, more youth to the programs that already exist. Thank you. I, I, would an, I would anticipate, just based on what we've seen at a national level, um, as w and we should soon have our own data back, but we know that students haven't had an opportunity to get outside, to be physically active, to participate um, in, in just the things they love, which is building off of what Peter just said. And so I think making sure that that is something that we expand on in, in our schools, um, in all ways, in a comprehensive way, through recess, physical education, more athletics, movement breaks, so I think that's important. Um, we also would um, wanna recognize that bullying uh, through electronic mm -hmm. um, sources, as Maria mentioned a little bit earlier, that we need to, to really have a comprehensive, strategic approach um, to building healthy relationships and pointing out some of the, or addressing some of those electronic uh, bullying parameters. Yeah. So, um, and overall, I just, I really believe that um, we need to make sure that our teachers are prepared so that mm -hmm. every single classroom is a place where students feel like, where, where they're feeling supported by their peers, but they're supported by their teachers. And there's really, a, we're creating an environment that where we can recognize when there's more need um, and, and therefore connect students to the resources and supports. And that, that includes connecting with family and doing, improving our ability to connect with family around that. Thank you. And Peter, I know you mentioned it twice now about that need for the athletics, arts, and extracurricular. And if anyone was tuning in on our budget hearings with BPS, um, myself, but others, and I filed an order also, we really need to do more than the dismal investment we have. We currently only invest $78 per student, but have a, over 24,000 per student budget. So we really need to, and they're only advocating right now to increase it to $98. So we are all saying it, so I'm glad that we are here saying it too with your experts. And I'm going to assume that the panelists coming up are also going to agree that we really need to do a bigger and better investment in our athletics and arts for our youth. So thank you for that. I think um, it's important to understand the time in history where we are within the Boston Police Department as well as, as nationally. And over the past 20 some odd years, we've been receiving funds from the Department of Justice to sort of be the end all and be all every time we go to a call for service. The person who responds, the social worker, the clinician, and so forth. We've developed over 25 years models that integrate experts with the, where we end and where we begin. So with the police department, we want to stay in the, in, in the lane in which we were trained to stay in, and we want to be able to have easy access to experts in the mental health field. And so many of the models that you see within the BPD have that model. We have youth service provider slash youth connect clinicians on hand when police officers uh, interact with a family that needs uh, much more comprehensive support and services. We have the blessed, best clinicians that do the ride-alongs. We have domestic violence advocates that reach out to families. Whether or not someone wants to report or not or, or move forward or not, these DV advocates reach out to these families and try to get them the services that they need. Um, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, so over the years we've integrated within our model the idea that we end, end and begin here, and you who are experts and, and well-educated in the work, 
now get a gentle pass off to be able to really support these families and these youth. And so I think that as we move forward, we have to keep that in mind. We've lost five dom domestic advocates to 10 over the past 10 years because of budget cuts. Um, each district gets 1,100 on average domestic violence calls for service every year with one DV advocate following up with all of those families. We have um, these best clinicians. We're trying to cover a best clinician in every district in the Boston Police Department because those best clinicians have to be able to respond immediately during the call for service. Um, and I can go on with why it's important for these positions to be available at time of call for service mm -hmm. and why it's important to continue to support this at time of service because many of these clinicians that do work in partnership with us are then taking on those families and referring them to more comprehensive long-term services. And so for us, we want to be able to continue doing that work in the way we do it best, which is we show up, we make, pretend, we, we make sure no one's going to get hurt in the process, and then we do the gentle handoff. That includes our hub model, Youth Connect, BEST, and our partnership with the Boston Public Health Commission when it comes to the trauma teams. Okay, thank so, you. thank you. And um, I would, oh, go ahead, please, yes. Thank um, you. Sorry, I'm Jenna Savage, I'm Deputy Director in the Office of Research Development at the BPD. Um, and I know when it comes to youth mental health, Obviously, when it comes to prevention and intervention, it's going to be the, like kind of the other end of the table. And when it, by the time it gets to the BPD, we're seeing kids. And I say we, Marie and I sit in office at headquarters. So I, I you know, if Sergeant Detective Tommy Sexton were here from the school police unit, he could tell you firsthand what he's seeing that's new. But what I can tell you that's new from my desk from where I sit at headquarters, um, you know, again, police are going to see students or, or youth when they're at the worst of the worst. And oftentimes, these mental health problems are going to present possibly criminally, possibly you know, these behavioral outbursts, walk that line of there is safety involved, but we don't know what sort of trauma or mental health is underlying these. Um, so I just, I know Maria mentioned it, and I just can't stress it enough as far as something that is new. You know, I want to give a shout out to Andrea Amador, who's here. You know, we've, we've been working so closely over the years with her and Sergeant Sexton and really trying to collaborate with schools and the police. Um, you know, again, without, without those school resource officers being that first line of defense in schools, and they know the students. They have those relationships, they get that context day in, day out. And then uh, if you're going to have legislation that's making it possibly more hard or more difficult for the BPD school police unit, who are again trained in juvenile mental health and have relationships with these students and have seen them time and time again, if you're going to make it harder for them to get into the schools, and if, and if they had a clinician and made it hard for the clinician to get into schools, then that last line of, line of defense, because when security is an issue and when safety is an issue, you're going to call 911, as you should. You know, if, if someone's in danger, you should call 911, and that is when the police get involved. Um, but if you are leaving it to just that last safety net, uh, then you're going to get district officers, and you don't, you know, th then you're leaving up a chance of who's coming. And we are trying to train more and more of our officers on mental health, especially juvenile mental health, SCIT training that we're trying to implement. We're going to do everything we can to make sure as many officers as we have as possible do have special training in this. But I think having those relationships, having that background information, is so important because you don't know what's happening in the background. And you know, the, the school police unit does do follow-ups and they do home visits and we have our best clinicians that can help with follow-ups and we can do threat assessments in the homes and there's a lot we can do to help ensure that by the time they come to us and it's the worst of the worst as far as like someone's just reached the end, you know, of some terrible outcome that's gonna re really an out, you know, result in an outburst or someone endangering themselves or others. It's going to happen, um, but I think there's so much more we could be doing and to kind of have those intermediate steps where it's not just then 911 and some random officer comes in. And that, that I think is new and it's a, I think that is a crisis. Um, and I, I think it's great that you're having this panel, but as Maria and I have been saying to each other, like a lot of dialogue is needed. We need to have conversations about how we can work better. And again, I can't say enough about Andrea Amador. I mean, she, there's so much great work that's being done, but there needs to be collaboration across the agencies and making sure that, that we're not just coming in at the last second. Awesome, I appreciate that. I do wanna go to my colleagues if they have a second. Last round of questions for the first panel. I just want to know for the record that Councilor Morell is giving me his time too, so I have my <laughs> time and his time. No, I just want to know. Um, and Councilor Murphy, you brought water for every, all the panelists. Is that is that a special touch? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, y'all. I got to food. There's oranges. I got to step it up because everybody got waters up in here. Good job. Um, I just wanted just to kind of really seize this moment to just acknowledge, right, like I really do appreciate the level of expertise and, and depth and, and passion that you all are bringing to 
this conversation, but I, I and I, I just would like to just elevate that. I don't see a black man on this panel. I don't see a black woman on this panel. I don't know, in terms of lived experience, you know, in terms of real profound lived experience, people who are dealing with issues of recovery, like um, mental health and wellness. I just feel like we've gotten to the point that the real experts are the ones who are really living these realities and uplifting them is so crucial to this work, right? And, and I do appreciate that we have a panel of nonprofit organizations, but the nonprofit organizations have to do God's work, and they usually have the least resources. So when we're talking about, um, I see the snaps, all right, y'all. There's not supposed to be any of that in this chamber, but, um, but as, we, as we continue to talk about these conversations, we cannot ignore or, or dismiss or disregard the reality that those who are living it and doing it on the front lines every single day are the best experts in this, right? And so administration and, and those who are, you know, trying to get a grasp on all of this, it's really important for us to, to recognize that that is something that is really obvious to me right now from the panel that, that I see here. And I just want to name that. And then the other piece is that, you know, there's also a, a level of accountability. Um, it's, and it's not just the Boston Public Schools and our community nonprofit organizations or our businesses. You know, we have, like, Children's Hospital, I believe, um, is doing a lot of work, right? You guys are doing a lot of work. I'm looking at y'all. Y'all doing a lot of work in the mental health and wellness space, right? Like, how do we really build an infrastructure here in the city of Boston that really gets at to this whole notion that we're re we are resource rich and coordination poor? We can't keep saying that and not then build the infrastructure and invest in the dollars of what a real infrastructure system is going to look like so that if, I'm, if, if my daughter um, has witnessed um, violence, that the person who does her hair knows about it, right? That where we go food shopping at the local bodega, they know that an incident has happened, that our schools and our teachers are, are set up to be able to understand. Like, our teachers can't always be the front lines. And when they go into these schools, um, they don't know everything that happened the night before, right? So then there needs to be some sort of infrastructure that we invest in uh, uh, that will help us um, get to, even if it's just a small pilot, a small pilot program that gets created with, you know, organizations who are on the ground doing the work, working in collaboration with the administration. But at, at some point, we can't just keep coming back and, and talking about all the amazing things that we're trying to do and keep having that conversation. Like, we need to say, here's what we're going to do as a result of what we learned in this space, and here's the commitment that I'm going to do um, to put my best foot forward to deal with this mental health crisis, because otherwise it's just blah, blah, blah all over again. That's just me. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Would you like Pe to follow? Peter was going to say something. Oh, please. please. So, um, uh, first of all, your, your comments are well taken. Um, second, uh, stay tuned from the Boston Public Health Commission. There, there will be developments around uh, mental health uh, efforts within the city on a larger scale uh, that I can't, I don't have details about yet, and the commission's not ready to really speak on that yet, but coming soon. Um, when it comes to uh, the representation today, uh, myself included, uh, I, I can speak for myself, um, a strong commitment to uh, the fact that I represent clinicians of color that are on the line, but also speak the systemic issues that also prevent uh, more clinicians of color from being in positions of leadership. Um, you know, right now the amount of student debt that is incurred to become a clinician in this city is, is very high. Uh, and then when it comes to licensure, there's cultural bias when it comes to those exams. Mm -hmm. And that many clinicians of color who are in wonderful clinicians uh, struggle to pass that exam uh, over and over again. And uh, so there's a, there's a credentialing issue that I don't think is really the fault of the clinicians, it's, it's the fault of a system that uh, has never considered them. Um, when it, and I just want to add to the, the previous uh, 
So that, that's another um, systemic tension that, should, that needs to be addressed. When it comes to the mental health of youth, we have to look at the systemic tensions that also uh, exist for their parents. And when it comes to uh, employers, uh, when they fear losing their job to attend to the mental health needs of their children, mm -hmm. uh, that's an issue. Um, there, there are ways that we as a society uh, really don't allow for mental health um, support. And anything that is done to relieve those or to create a, a more trauma-informed and more mental health supportive environment in every situation, at every level of our society is going to impact this issue in a positive way. Thank you. Yes, you have one minute. Thank okay. you. I just, uh, that was one of the first things I said, Councillor Mejia, was that I came here as a white woman, but only on behalf of the two Latina leaders that uh, coordinate our Department of Student uh, and Community Impact and the Office of Social Work. I wanted to let you know that our Office of Social Work is 68% BIPOC, uh, and 56% uh, of the team are bi or multilingual. And for the school psychologists, it's 41% BIPOC and 47% bi or multilingual, and we are committed to the retainment and recruitment. We also struggle with uh, uh, maintaining licensure and are, have strong training programs with uh, local universities and partners. I would also just say our main concern is the continued trauma exposure and hoping that we could implement uh, continued teacher training so that teachers are able to deal with what they're seeing because we aren't we haven't equipped our teachers appropriately to be able to support that thank you for that i'm just gonna for the record i'm gonna add one more line item to when we think about um the the, the data um lived experience i think like it's great black and brown is great and I'm, i do i'm all here for that but i think that there also needs to be a profound lived experience line too that speaks i'm just I'm just, I just think something for us to consider as a city, because I think once you live it, um, you know how to talk about it in ways that are very different. Um, I, I, and, the, and the culture, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to debate. No, I'm happy no, I'm not, to I'm know that debate. there's um, an increase on, you know, the number of, of black and brown and, and, you know, clinicians who are multilingual. I, I just think that it's important as I continue to navigate in this space that I continue to uplift lived experience, because when you have lived it and you've been a survivor, you just have a whole different way of like how you can fix the problem because you've lived it. And so you wish th these things would have been done for you. So I just want to name that as something that for us to consider. I'm going to stop talking because I know y'all like tied here. So, so. No, no further questions okay, at this time. Thank Madam you. I, I thank you all. I appreciate you. If you'd like to stay, you can, um, but we'll be calling the second panel down. So thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And the second panel, um, Todd Payton from Greater Malden Behavioral Health, Catherine Buki, clinical psychologist at South Cove Community Health Center. If you know you're in the second panel, you can make your way down, please. We have Shella Dennery from Boston Children's Hospital and Erin Borgalt from East Boston Neighborhood Health Center. Um, it should be before I think there's four panel. Oh, thank you for the chair. Yes, thank you. Oh, I think I see someone up. And Erin is zooming in virtually. I see you up there. So I will let you know when it's your turn to. Um, Share, okay? Thank you for being here. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will start um, at this end. We'll have 20 minutes for um, the panelists to share what you know you're experiencing through this pandemic. Thank you for being here. I really do appreciate it. I know my colleagues do. And um, if you could just state your name and your affiliation when you start, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Councilor Murphy and members of the committee, thank you for providing this opportunity, especially about this important and timely topic. I'm Dr. Shella Dennery. I'm a social worker, and I've spent my entire career working in partnership with the Boston Public Schools. 
I'm the director of the Boston Children's Hospital and Neighborhood Partnerships Program, which is a school-based behavioral health program. Next school year marks our 20th year of working with BPS. We have a team of 17 social workers and psychologists, um, and we provide a comprehensive range of supports. We do professional development, we do consultation, um, we also do clinical work in schools. And we are a pretty unique program in that we partner at the individual school level, we also partner with the district, and we also partner on initiatives. So we're working on the student success team initiative right now. We're also partnering with the behavioral health department and the social work department to work on professional development. Children's has also been a funder and supported a number of initiatives within BPS, including the comprehensive behavioral health model that is led up by Andrea Amador. Um, and this, office, this funding comes from the Office of Community Health and John Reardon, who is here from Children's and a advocate and huge supporter of this work. I work closely with the Children's Mental Health Campaign in Massachusetts. I've helped develop an advisory panel for the state on school mental health, and we're working on a policy and advocacy brief right now on best practices for school mental health for the state of Massachusetts. It is a real honor to be here. Um, I listened to the hearing on Monday and I wanted to echo the concerns about adults in schools. I mean, I'm very concerned about kids and adolescents, but I'm very concerned about teachers. Qualitatively, we're hearing a lot of stories about absences of our teachers, of our staff, and their well-being, including burnout, emotional exhaustion, and that is on the forefront of my mind. I'm also really concerned about parents. I'm a parent myself, and that keeps me humble as well. I have a second and fourth grader. <laughs> um, and I think um, many educators are just getting by, which is not okay. Um, and we've heard that there's a lot of morale issues as well. Um, so we have been thinking a lot about resiliency of educators and how we prevent them leaving the field, to be honest. Um, and it's high, the risks are high. So a disclaimer before I share my remarks, I'm a huge supporter and believer in BPS. I'm invested in this work. I can't imagine working anywhere else. 20 years have gone by, I hope for 20 more. But today, I wanted to talk about staffing, organizational structure, and models of care that we're seeing from, as an outside partner. It's well known that BPS has invested in behavioral health positions recently, and we're grateful for that, so we wanted to say thank you. But many of us in this room have been advocating for that for a very long time, and the newly formed social work department with 168 positions is incredible, Jenna. Um, these efforts are, are to be applauded, but I want to highlight a few things about them. These positions should have always been there. If you look at surrounding towns and cities, social work positions and departments like this are not new. They are foundational, they should be expected. Although this is a new and a large investment for BPS and the city of Boston, it is just the beginning. BPS is catching up to the standards and norms and foundations for school supports. And I <laughs> hesitate to say it, but it's a little bit embarrassing. Uh, this investment is needed and it's gonna, it's gonna need to be greater and it's need, it needs to be bigger. So this is the beginning. Beyond that, the infrastructure, there's one director for social work, one director for behavioral health. They might have an assistant director for you know, teams of 170 people. <laughs> I don't know if I need to say more, but I will. Um, the social work positions also do not come with supervision. So for those of us who do this work, you are exposed to trauma, poverty, violence on a daily basis. And the wellness of us um, is, is very important. I also really think that was what was just said about training teachers, and that's something that we also do. We have a training program. We have a whole bunch of workshops around helping teachers understand this and to help them navigate, because in their courses, in their, their field of education, they're not getting that training either. Um, so we know hiring social workers in these positions in urban education without supervision and regular support is unacceptable. For a clinical team, um, more training oversight is needed. I think m most of us are worried that without this, Social workers are gonna start doing roles in schools that are just needed. We start filling gaps, we start doing, and then there's really no coordination around inf the infrastructure. Um, and we, we feel like we're setting social workers up to fail. BPS is trying to build houses in this area, but we have not laid a foundation, nor do we have the leadership teams at the top to do this work well. Two administrators for a clinical team, these sizes are not, accept not acceptable. There's also not enough school psychologists in BPS, and I'm guessing you've heard this, but however, somehow talking about this has become controversial, and I'm not sure why. We have um, 85 psychologists for the 123 buildings in our city right now, and there's 20-something being added next school year, but that's still not enough. Um, but it's not wise to stretch these positions um, in this way. And to be transparent, I do not see mental health as being like a therapy model. Mental health is for all of us, all of our kids. It should be open door. We should have groups. We should have interventions in the classroom. But without the capacity or the staffing to do this, we cannot do some of the things that are promised or, or, or do them well. Or what I heard on Monday was we have things in some schools, but not all schools, which is also not okay in this city. With the resources that we have, these things should be universal. Um, 
it's not about disciplines per se, but I do think that an approach to this work is a team approach. It should have a social worker, a psychologist, a nurse, a family liaison, and guidance counselors on the teams, um, and many schools that we have in Boston do not have the capacity to do this right now. As a partner and a collaborator, collaborator, I've been increasingly confused on why social work, psychology, nursing, and guidance sit in different cabinets, and they have different reporting structures and different leaders in the city. It's worth noting that these positions are all expected to work together hand in hand in our schools, but they are separated and siloed from one another. The positions overlap with shared work, and a coherence in infrastructure in Boston Public Schools would be helpful. And it changes every time we have a superintendent, every time we have new leaders. And so those of us who have been around for a long time are noting how chaotic this can feel. We know that the behavioral health system outside of BPS is broken. It's fragmented. It, as a parent, it's really, really hard to get care, to access care, to get the things we need for our kids. We do not need to replicate this by doing the same within our school buildings and district. And lastly, I just want to talk about the approach to behavioral health in schools, and I want to reassure you that there are best practices for this work, and some of this work is happening in BPS today. We've been working for over a decade with Andrea Amador and her team and the Comprehensive Behavioral Health Model. Boston Children's has invested $2 million in this initiative to sort of think about a coordinated, multi-system of support, tiered approach to interventions. And it seems like every time we have new administration or leadership, institutional knowledge is lost and we are reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And they, things are the same. It may be called MTSS, it may be CBHM. They're the same conversations. And so knowing that there actually are best practices, that this is not rocket science, that we can, can do this work together, and that there are approaches that could be helpful, um, but that are disconnected. And I think from the last panel, it was really clear that there is not coordinated care or coordinated approaches. Um, so finding ways to build upon best practices and working together is needed in this moment. And in closing, I would just like to say that I hope we continue to find ways to center student voice and family voice and what they need in these conversations as we plan ahead. And thank you for having this hearing and bringing up this important issue. Thank you, thank you, Shella. I do just want to um, comment that I was a teacher in BPS for over 20 years, but your um, understanding and that explanation is very helpful for this conversation and the needs that we have and that we need. And I do just also want to state that we do know that we have many children in our city who aren't in the Boston public school system, so we will continue as a council to advocate for all of our students that are in charter schools or private schools also, but thank you for that. Knowledge is helpful. Um, so Catherine, please, yes, thank you. Good morning, um, Councilwoman Murphy. Thank you for having me here. Um, I am Dr. Catherine Buki, I'm a psychologist at South Coast Community Health Center, which is predominantly an Asian community health center in Boston, Quincy, and in Malden that serves primarily Asian immigrants. Um, and so I've been here for 22 years, and I particularly serve the Vietnamese uh, immigrants in, in these areas. I'm also an assistant professor at William James College, uh, where I teach family, family systems courses, but I'm also the director of the Asian Mental Health Program, which is the first in the nation, actually, mm -hmm. for a graduate program. And all of this is very intertwined and with my comments coming up. So as we've heard, suicide and um, social emotional needs of children have always been present. However, through the pandemic the last two years, I've seen an increased rise, particularly in the Asian communities, because there has been an increase in xenophobia, racism, and discrimination within our families. I want to share pers uh, personal stories from my clinic because it highlights the fear and safety of the Asian community. As the pandemic came through now almost three years, um, I've seen an increase in self-injurious behaviors in our, uh, in our young people. In particular, there was an 11-year-old kid that was referred to my, to my service. He was an immigrant, just came from China a year before, and he was referred because he had brought a knife to school and started cutting himself. And when I asked him, do you know why you're here? He said, I am bad and I'm in trouble. He proceeds to tell me that in class, um, in one of the school districts, he, the kids were teasing him, saying, you're stupid, you're ugly, you eat bats, and all that. And as he turned to his teacher, as we tell our kids, turn to an adult you trust to get support, the teacher turned to him and said, the kids are joking, get over it. So what he did was he internalized all that hatred, went out, bought a knife, and started cutting his arm. It finally was noticed by the school teacher, and so the parents would uh, refer for counseling. And as I'm listening to the story, I turned to the mother. She had tears in her eyes. And she said, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? It did come from China, didn't it? I'm gonna tell a second story. 
a Vietnamese young woman was in a domestic violence shelter outside of Boston. So she was isolated during this whole time. She did not come out. And when one day in spring, when the weather was warmer, she took her four-year-old child out to the park. As she was going out, she noticed that other families started picking up their children, putting them in the school, and walking away from her. She really did not have an idea what was going on. She watched as her four-year-old son was playing in the sandbox. Another child came up to him, yanked off his mask, and punched him. And when she asked the child, why did you hit my son, he said he wasn't wearing a mask. This highlights one of many, many stories that we've heard over this time where our Asian families are at, still at risk in the fear of their safety. And it is part of, we want to have the teachers, the schools, um, community to come together and say, this has to stop. We know that suicide is now the leading death among Asian, um, among Asian youth, ages of 15 and 24. We know that since the pandemic, um, racism in particular has heightened the mental health symptoms, we see more depression, anxiety, and trauma. So what do we do about it? We have, I, for where I work at South Co, we do work closely with the school systems because there are, there are psychologists and, and social workers in the, in, the, in the schools, but they're not able to speak to the parents. So we act as that bridge. So there's a huge need of translators and interpreters that are culturally appropriate to be able to manage these needs. In our, right now at South Co, we have five clinics. We will be down to two cl clinicians in July. Myself and another person will be covering five clinics. We have 35,000 patients at South Co. So we are always looking for bilingual, bicultural, um, clinicians, and as we've heard, it's very difficult to train, um, to bring them in for funding to pay for college or for their graduate programs. But in particular, we need those who actually speak an Asian dialect. Asian dialects, just for Chinese, does not mean it's great. You have a Chinese person, but you know if they're Cantonese speaking, Mandarin speaking, Fujianese speaking, Toisanese speaking, and so we we have those very specific needs in our in our health center. The second point to it is, so it leads to my work as a director of the Asian Mental Health Concentration at William James. We are, again, we're the first in the country to train. We want to uh, attract and retain young people who want to work with the Asian community, who have the language capacity, who will stay in the community and work with them. And that, again, we will need to have funding and scholarship for these students to come through. Um, so I'll stop my comments, but there is a high need. This is a population that's often overlooked invisible um, and so I thank you for your thank time. You. I appreciate that. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Todd Payton. I'm the CEO of Greater Malden Behavioral Health. Uh, we are in um, North Shore, Boston, <laughs> primarily providing wraparound service for kids and their families. Um, thank you Councilor Murphy and the other Councilor for having me here. I'm very happy to say that um, I'm really, really pleased to be living in Massachusetts and not other parts of the country right now. And even though we're talking about serious issues, we are leaps and bounds above and more progressed than other places. So that opportunity that we have here is hopefully sets a standard and a record uh, for, for, for people to follow for years. Um, I live here in the city. I've been living here for, I don't know, 35 years practicing. I am a licensed mental health clinician, and I happen to live by the Trotter School in Roxbury. And one of the places that, uh, one of the good things I could say in living there is I'm between the laughter of the Trotter School and the Christmas Attics uh, daycare nursery uh, center uh, up, the, up the street as well. And we've missed that over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a metaphor for what is happening in our communities for the kids and the wider aspect. We don't have laughter. We don't have happiness. And those issues related to 
trauma, the issues related to uh, lack of housing, uh, food, uh, uh, water, clean air, really makes a difference and a negative difference, uh, unfortunately, on, on, on our kids and our families. So one of the things that Greater Malden that we try to, 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 to do is to talk about what are some of the things that you can do with families immediately, whether it's through Zoom, or, you know, over technology, or uh, through in, in person. And one of the things that we say that, that there should be uh, a, a focus on four areas. One is your um, physical health. So we gotta get the people moving. Even if they're in their home, they've gotta start moving. So whether that's dancing, uh, doing exercises, but you gotta move the body. The second thing that we say is you gotta eat well. So crappy food produces crappy moods. And so your food intake is really important. So what is it that you can eat that will support you physically and mentally? The third thing that we look at is your mental health. How are you coping with who you are and the people that you love or the people that are surrounding you? And what or how are you communicating that? And then the fourth thing is what's going on around your spirituality, not in the sense of a religious aspect, but just how are you balancing all of those to bring some level of calmness and peace within your life? At Greater Malden, we really believe that looking at those four things can really lessen the difficulties that you're having in your, in your life. We started to partner, and we have partnered with different churches around opening them back up in a sense of providing uh, a space for therapy to happen, providing a space for you know food, uh, good quality food to happen, um, sports to happen, supportive uh, physical activity. And one of the things I, I know that, uh, Council, I know that you uh, were a proponent, uh, Dave, your, your staff told me that you talked about yoga and meditation. Those are real important, you know, life skills mm -hmm. um, as walking and running and all those things as well. So those are some of the aspects that we're trying to get these churches to sort of do more of and not only with the community around them, but with their parishioners as well or attendees as well and doing that part and sharing those building space to actually do that. So hopefully the mental health of kids, families, and the community can have a more positive uh, impact on, uh, on them and, and our society. So I'm really happy that we've been able to provide this service and I'm really happy that uh, you're offering an opportunity for us to, uh, to talk about that today. And the last thing I, I will definitely have to say is at our agency, we speak about 15 different languages. So when you talk about cultural and linguistic need, it is so important. And one of the things that I will make note of is that when you have people coming from other countries, they come with their own uh, particular culture and what their countries uh, you know, offer them. When they get here to America, they've got to assimilate two ways themselves, but they also have to assimilate into what are they seeing in relation to the kids and families that they're dealing with, not from through their lens of their culture, but through the lens of what the American culture expects and offers. And so we do a lot of that work as well with our clinicians and our families. And I think that's very important, you know, for those recent immigrant or those people who speak a second language, English as a second language, for them to understand what mental health is and what's provided here. So, so thank you. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, before we go to Erin, I do just want to recognize that President Flynn has joined us. Thank you. Oh, and also, Councillor Fernandez Anderson has joined us also. Um, you can go, Erin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor.
Claire Murphy, and thank you for the opportunity to participate uh, virtually today. Uh, my name is Erin Bergalt. I'm with the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our community-based trauma support services and our community collaborations, um, specifically and how we're working to support young people in our community. And um, instead of just diving into what we do, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about the how and what the framework that we're bringing to this work. So we're um, in our community-based trauma services, in addition to our integrated behavioral health services at EBNHC, we're bringing um, a trauma-informed practice and equity framework. So. Um, part of what this means is understanding trauma from an ecological perspective, thinking about the individual, collective, systemic, ongoing, and then intergenerational and historical trauma. Um, using the trauma-informed approach means shifting from what's wrong. So that could be what's wrong with this individual, what's wrong with this community, with, with um, young people to what happened. And so really bringing that approach um, that's grounded in the PACES framework, um, the positive and adverse childhood experiences framework. Um, we also, I know this has been touched on by other um, people on this panel, but we um, vision healing for all. So thinking about um, community members, coalition members, providers in the community, and really seeing um, community-based healing services um, that the, the people who are providing healing modalities that, that, that their healing and their wellness matters too in order to really be engaging in this from a, from a trauma-informed practice. Um, and so all of our work is really grounded in collaborations and having at the forefront community partnerships and bringing the support work that, that we have, the offerings to the community. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our coalitions, but specifically with working with young people, we're working on trying to offer um, healing supports and services that are often not available because of systemic barriers in the community based on race, class, documentation status, um, language, ability, and then also thinking about access to child care, um, working long hours, working many different jobs. Um, so really trying to eliminate those barriers and break down silos with community partners to expand collaboration and promote more holistic healing services in addition to, um, to behavioral health services that are clinic-based. Um, so a couple of the coalitions that I'm a part of, I coordinate the Neighborhood Trauma Team in East Boston, and I know that that's been mentioned, the Neighborhood Trauma Team Network. Just wanted to talk a little bit about the two approaches to the East Boston trauma teamwork. Um, there's the response and recovery work and then ongoing healing support services. So we respond to trauma on the community level. Many of the types of traumatic incidents in addition to community violence that we work with have already been mentioned today, thinking about school conflicts and bullying, domestic violence, hate crime, sexual assault and harassment, and then also working with community members around immigration-related trauma and substance use-related trauma, um, trauma connected to substance use loss um, as well. And so really breaking this down into, um, into the, the response and recovery work. So how do we respond as a community with our partners after traumatic incidents happen? And then what are our ongoing healing programs that are provided um, consistently that people can tap into when they're ready after experiencing traumatic events. And what we see in addition to working with folks across intergenerational trauma is that a lot of people in our community are still processing or experiencing re-traumatization based on trauma they experienced in their home country or on the journey through migration here. And so incorporating that lens and that immigrant justice lens and partnering with our um, immigrant justice collaborators through different partnerships. Um, and then um, 
One relatively new during COVID program that's a part of the Neighborhood Trauma Team is the Trauma Team in East Boston Community Support Collective, which is a, um, a team of five community healers, all immigrants um, across different documentation statuses. And um, it's the idea is offering both one-on-one -on -one emotional accompaniment and um, providing workshops and trainings in the community um, that includes um, emotional support groups, grief and healing groups, um, picnic saludables, which are like a way to be out in the community eating healthy picnics um, and, and um, healthy food together. I also wanted to touch on um, another coalition, which is the Eastie Coalition, which is the Substance Use and Prevention Coalition, which has a peer-to-peer -peer, um, program, has workshops in schools. So we're really working on that intersection between thinking about um, substance use support work, substance use prevention work, and then trauma support and recovery work. So really collaborating across there, we work together um, with this coalition, um, along with a few community partners that really center youth work, like Maverick Landing Community Services, the Transformational Prison Project, to provide bi-weekly peace circles in the community, both a, a young person-focused peace circle and then an intergenerational peace circle as a way to um, work together and provide space for neighbors supporting neighbors and emotional accompaniment rooted in the, the indigenous practice of circles. Um, we also work at the East Boston Farmers Market to have different tables and young people have, have um, workshops that they lead around substance use. Um, support and prevention. And then lastly, I wanted to touch on how, um, in addition to the, the behavioral health services that we provide at the East Boston Neighborhood Health Center, um, we are Part, we are a partner at EBNHC in a community-based healing center initiative, which is a collaboration of different community partners that's working on expanding and integrating different healing modalities in the community. So we see that um, more conventional, more traditional behavioral health support are not enough. Um, as we know, there's a clinician shortage, but even if there were so many clinicians, it's it, there's also a need, as folks have mentioned before me, for mind-body supports, for different, um, different forms of healing modalities, connection to nature, connection to healthy food, as folks um, have mentioned. So we're a partner in this community-based framework that's grounded in cultural humility, healing justice, and restorative justice values that's working to provide, at this time, satellite healing um, services at different community events with the idea of having barrier-free access to trauma-informed modalities and also um, have the connection to nature, so having different events in parks. Um, eventually, our goal is to, to go on hikes um, with the community and um, really having that connection to nature in addition to having community healers that are that provide and are compensated for providing different modalities like Reiki, different movements, trauma-informed yoga, um, meditation, and dance, um, among other things. So um, so we are really, really hoping for the expansion of all, all of the points that I talked about, expansion of community partners, bringing mental health and holistic mind-body supports to different organizations and agencies in East Boston and not just being center-based and then coalition work um, and mind-body healing modality expansion. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I do just want to state that I, I like that you talked about recovery and substance use support because this is part of the crisis we're going through. Um, just um, to be clear, we are going to um, give the councils five minutes each. We will start with Councilor Mejia is the order, then President Flynn, and then Councilor Fernandez Anderson. So I'm going to put the timer on, and you can start, Councilor Mejia. That's triggering. Um, no, I'm just joking. Um, and a really quick, just so that I'm clear, we I would just have one round. Um, we can come back if we okay. need, but we'll do the first round with five minutes. Okay, each. that sounds thank great. Thank you. So thank you to the panelists. Really do appreciate all that you bring um, to the space. 
Uh, um, you know, I just, because of the line of work that you do, uh, you probably have a different sensibility in terms of what shows up for parents. And I'm so glad that you're uplifting the importance of like adults, because while this is about youth, um, our, if our young people are not doing well, then they go home to spaces and places where they're not well either. We're just um, passing down um, bad ways of taking care of self, right? So I do have a very specific question. Um, and, and for those folks who follow my journey, you know my story, right? So I was one of those kids that attempted suicide when I was in, you know, in my teenage years. And my mom was undocumented for a period of time and she was so afraid to um, bring me to the hospital. And that, uh, so she decided to make me drink milk and oil so that I can throw up. And I grew up believing that my mom did not love me. And it wasn't until I was at an event in 2016 in my 40s that I learned for the first time that my mom did love me, but she was just so afraid. And she took care of me the best way she knew how. But based on that experience and how I then manifest this with my own daughter around just putting your feelings to the side, you'll be okay, get over it. We are passing down our own trauma to our children every day because we don't know how to show up. So with that, can you just talk to us a little bit about the work that needs to happen um, and so that we can create the type of culture and environment where we're not passing down trauma to our children? <laughs> but I do want to say, I think a lot of this has to do with stigma and us being able to have conversations like this where someone like you can actually share your journey. I feel like that is incredibly powerful. There's not often spaces where leaders in our city stand up and say, I have experienced mental health. It's in my family. When all of us are touched by this, there's not a family in here who isn't touched by mental health. So I feel like a lot of this is first opening up these conversations. I think I'm really encouraged just by schools generally because you know we're at Binca, the International Newcomers Academy. And we work with you know, their, their uh, seniors and we've been doing some really innovative programming around having mental health and immigrant mental health being talked about and taught in the classroom and then they do a capstone project on it. They present their work on mental health to their peers. Like once we start to norm, like this is all over the media. Mental health is everywhere, it's being talked about. But the more we can get kids to start to talk about it and actually have factual information about it, I think it's really powerful. And I loved what um, the other council, um, member said about peer-to-peer -peer, like the more that kids can talk to each other I mean there is a whole role for adults for mm -hmm. sure But I think when I think about healing and I think it is really having spaces that do feel Comfortable and brave enough where people can share their own struggles or that they know actually what to do when they have them Because yeah. at some point all of our youth will be touched by this in some way. Yeah but I, I You have one, one more minute. minute. You have one and a half minutes. Okay, um, so I'll just uplift two things one is um uh, Todd, I really do appreciate you starting off with joy, right? Because um, as people of color, there's so much resistance and, and, and resiliency in, in just showing up every day. Um, and we also have to recognize the power and the strength in our struggle that despite what we are going through, we're strong, right? And if we can uplift and, and center joy um, and laughter and healing, um, and shifting the culture, I think that that would be important. And I'm just so sad that I only have a less than a minute because I think that this is one of the biggest conversations and I think a lot of the stuff needs to just change systemically, culturally, and we need to create environments in our workforce, in our schools that really elevate and lean into mental health and wellness and that it's not gonna just be this conversation. There's just so much work that we all have to do. So my time is up and I just, you, you wanna say? Yeah, yeah please. I love what you said. Um, I was nodding, it's like, oh, it's, it, it's right, it hits right here. And you know, your question of how we have to help the parents, to help the families, to help the child. And that's the work we do at South Cove, right? Um, I agree that telling our personal, I mean, there's boundaries, but I come from a refugee family. Um, and I didn't learn about my parents' experience until I was in grad school. And they told me, and I just cried, I bawled, because prior to that, I asked and they just would not tell me. As we know, many of our immigrant and refugee kids, they have no idea what their history, what their parents went through. Many of those that we uh, treat right now are undocumented. So to your point, they don't want to bring their child, they don't want to go to themselves to the hospital, so what we do at South Cove is that we are on call 24-7, live. We don't do um, an on-call system, we take it, I take it. 
So I get those phone calls and they will not take them. So what do we do with help prevent, prevent um, before suicide happens or the attempts? I do, we do a lot of um, working with families and in particular we talk about the issues of racism and xenophobia that occurred. At William James we created a parent guide how to talk to children, how to help parents talk to their children about the discrimination history, discriminatory history against Asians in the US. They don't know. They don't know how to talk to their children because they don't have that lived experience here. So we translate into four different languages. So it's in Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese. And as of right now, there have been 9,000 downloads on parents using it and talking to their children. And so these are things that we're trying to be creative. We have to hit right at the parents and really talk to them. And how, do you, how are you being helpful or healthy to help your children? So again, I appreciate um, your story. And I, I do believe that we need to talk. We need to say that we have suffered and we are overcome it. Because um, that helps to open up the conversation. Thank you. President Fung? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the important work that you're doing in this field as a, as a school teacher um, and as a city councilor as well. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the panelists for your testimony, but also to the people in the audience as well that have dedicated their life to this issue as well. So just want to acknowledge the importance of this hearing, but also maybe, maybe, maybe I'll try to tell a, a somewhat of a, an issue that, that's important to me as it relates to mental health. I had the opportunity to, to serve um, about 24 years in the military. And, and during, during that period of time, I have seen um, the stigma in the military about going and accessing mental health counseling for families and for, and for people that are serving. But over time, the more you talk about it, the more acceptable it is. So what you're doing here today is critical. And, and I'll go back to the, to the military for one more second. We have over 22 veterans a day that commit suicide. And most of those veterans that commit suicide every day, a lot of them are not engaged in mental health counseling, social services. Um, some of them are, but about 70% of them are not. Um, so the, the importance of this type of hearing in, in letting people know where services are is critical. So again, I want to say thank you to the, the sponsor, but also to the panelists and to the to the audience as well. And maybe maybe one one quick question. I I was listening to your comments about the important work South Cove plays in the mental health counseling for especially for young people and just want to acknowledge that and say thank you. We also know that during this couple of years, it's been a very difficult period of time for the AAPI community. We've seen hate crimes increase. We've seen anti-Asian racism. We've seen assaults on AAPI community, but other immigrant groups as well, not only here in Boston, but across the country. But yet, but yet but you, you, you want to, the important part of that is acknowledging that we do have si significant problems that, that are important to address, but also to make sure that immigrant neighbors um, have access, full access to, um, to mental health counseling and uh, social services. And I, I was struck by the, the, the comment you made, it, it's an important comment, but what's even more important is that we provide services to undocumented residents as well in making sure that they have equal access and full access to medical care, including mental health counseling, regardless of what your status is. And that, that's regardless of what immigrant 
community you are, but it's important to ensure that all immigrants, regardless of their status, have access to medical care and mental health counseling and, and, and services. Um, so I, maybe I'll ask one quick question. How can, we, how can we work together as a city council, as a city, as a state, in making sure that immigrant communities are comfortable accessing mental health services, even though it may have been a stigma for their parents to have received counseling? Maybe it's kind of a two-part question. I think that's an excellent question. How can you help? I think two things can happen. One is to put it out in the in those networks that you want to have listening sessions from those folks, from the parents, from the children, with the different uh, language and cultural uh, concerns that that you're putting out together. So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is make some action plans based on those issues related to policy and resources. So it's really going directly to the source and having those folks speak to you directly as to what their needs are. But that's an excellent, excellent question. If I could follow, I, I agree with that 100%. I also, I think with the piece of language access, many of the immigrant groups don't know where to go. And when they do, it's all in English. And so even if they are encouraged to sign up to speak to an organization, insurance, the, no one's there to, to explain to them what this means. I think the other important aspect is that the immigrants need to know that uh, the community health centers, uh, CBOs, all that, we're not connected to ICE. Right. We are not there to deport them, to report them. And that is the one thing that I've seen over the years of working at South Cove is that they are afraid that, to come in. And so we try to put out there that we are not here, you know, we collect information, but it doesn't go anywhere, we don't report you. But I think it's not just in the Asian community, it's in all communities. That we have, and it has to come from the city council, has come from the police, public safety, that we're not here to deport you. And I think that then they will start coming in. But I also think um, <laughs> there's a lot of medical mistrust in many communities still. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're undocumented and you are scared, like mm -hmm. I really, I mean, I am excited to see all these nonprofits in this room because it isn't just about mental health. And mental health, I mean, let's be honest, it's sort of a traditional white Western way of thinking. Like an individual therapy hour is a luxury. So I feel like the more we can create innovative systems of care that are about care coordination and supporting families and kids and the community that are outside of the box, that are not diagnosable, that are not billable, I think that's the approach that really opens doors for people to access care. It hasn't been said today, but most mental health providers are, I think it's 80 to 85% of us are white. Mm -hmm. Women, 84%. 84. I mean, that's a huge problem too. And I think someone had already said, like, how do we reimburse for loans? How do we make social work schools and psychology schools more affordable? How do we pay for internships? It's a huge crisis. Um, the field needs to look like the community, um, and it's there has been movement, and we're excited about that. But there's so much work to be done. But also, just in the the models of care that we have are broken. They don't work. They don't work for my kids. They don't work for my family but also thinking about who's providing that care. I think there's so many layers of work we can do to make this more open, the doors open for people. Thank you. Erin, um, did you wanna chime in before we go to Councilor Fernandez to answer that? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Just really quickly, I wanted to share um, one pilot program that EBNHC has done um, in collaboration with La Colaborativa in Chelsea. They reached out to us about um, hearing um, Collaborativa members and their unmet mental health needs, but at the same time, folks in not being accessible necessarily, like people have mentioned, have more conventional office-based behavioral health services. So we went to them to lead a trauma-informed yoga and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy um, program. And um, talking to people who participated. Some people came because they're curious to try yoga. Some people came really interested in CBT. And I think that it was a real way to provide an offering in collaboration with a community partner that wasn't necessarily a conventional therapy group, um, but could really provide emotional support for community members. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Fernandez? Uh, thank you. Um, 
it's uh, Anderson. My, my middle name just got <laughs> stuck in there somehow, and uh, everyone now is just struggling to pronounce Fernandes. <laughs> Anya Fernandez Anderson. Right, it's not even Fernandez, it's Fernandes. It's not Spanish, but yeah, who cares? Well, you don't have to be the first one. You get uh, thank you. There, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's part of our mental health, right? We have to know who we are. Yes. Yeah, well, I hope this doesn't. I, I feel no, like it's I'm cutting into my time. I'm going to start your time. All right. So now you go. <laughs> uh, Assalamualaikum, brother. How are you? Hi, nice to see you. Um, not sure if you can see me, but it's uh, Tanya Anderson from Pyramid. We've worked together with Dr. Omar and um, in Public Health um, Commission. Um, and so I think that, I mean, I, I, I wasn't here to hear all of the panelists and their comments. Um, so it, I don't think it's fair for me to say that I actually have a full assessment of what my questions are. But um, my position in terms of mental health services in the city of Boston or my experience, my experience as a woman who was formerly undocumented for 17 years um, in this country and also um, working in the mental health field, I think that, you know, to your point, um, sis, I'm sorry, what's your name? Uh, Shella. Uh, to Shella's point, I think um, a lot of these, uh, you know, medical, uh, medical necessity, uh, what it, or medically needed a diagnosing so that we can bill for the service um, is a prison pipeline. And I think that the issue is that we're not, we have to look at circumstantial situations or, uh, so that we are beginning to um, hopefully maybe file a, a, some sort of policy to ask MassHealth to cover at least the first three months of um, just getting to know you, assessment, understanding, uh, whatever is circumstantial for that um, family or client or child. Um, and I think that eventually my concern is that a lot of the FIFA service that goes into the home is not really um, implementing uh, the framework effectively so that eventually we have a whole bunch of black and brown babies with diagnosis and folks that don't really have not had the time to, to get to know that kid or that family and leaving them with harsh diagnosis or leaving them with diagnosis that perhaps it was just, again, situational or circumstantial. So um, holding Mass Health accountable and asking them for at least three months um, the first three months of just getting to know the child and assessing, fully assessing the situation. I don't think that 45 minutes is enough to go in and you don't know the kid and maybe they just became homeless and now you're di we're diagnosing them. So I think that paying attention to that and obviously, you know, the demographics that we serve and who is represented, as you said, 84 uh, percent white females. Um, and then as we know it, situation or relationships that we build with our therapists are extremely important. Um, and just for the record, I, I believe that mental health is for everyone, it's a spectrum, and everyone at some point in their lives is dealing with it, whether temporary or not. Um, so I think that that's crucial, and that's why I, I really appreciate Dee Dee's cry in terms of bringing in and other uh, nonprofits that I know in the community, Pyramid Build or others that I've, that I've gotten to know, Osiris or Co the Commonwealth, then you have uh, Rock Children's Services of Roxbury, um, that I do uh, have providers that are black um, providing these services, but there's just not enough, and I agree with you, Shella. Um, so I think to, to your point, um, I'm with you on that, and I would, I would love to look at ways of looking at services that we don't have to diagnose people before we get to know them. And I think uh, for our program at Boston Children's, we work with Boston Public Schools, we fundraise so that we don't have to diagnose kids and use a fee-for-service model. So we can open our doors, we can do individual therapy, we can do group therapy, we can go to their home. We don't have to be bound by insurance. We don't have to be bound by a label because we know many kids are coming in with situational experiences from the environment, from the community, and that's not label-worthy, right? So I, I, I agree fully. I do think um, there was one other point that you just made about therapy being for all, um, but I'll come back to that. I don't know if anyone wants to. Yeah, if I could just follow up on that. If, you could, if we could do that for mass health to pay for the first three months without uh, a diagnosis. So we try, we try very hard not to give, but we have to, to be paid. So the one that we give is adjustment disorder, which we feel is the most benign. Everyone is adjusting to something at any time. 
However, it only can last for so long because MassHealth or other insurance will come back and say, you have to change it. And that is where this most difficult is we do not want to pathologize and stigmatize our families and our youth, but that is one of the big issues. So I, I do appreciate you sh um, bringing that up. Thank you. I mean, I think, I think that it's a filing with, uh, as a um, home rule petition with the state um, and asking mm -hmm. for that, but I mean, it'd be interested in, with, with um, in terms of CBHI and how it came from a class lot ass suit and mm -hmm. what that means and um, or the impact. So we'd ha I'd have to obviously do some research. We've started to um, partner with some folks to look into it, Children's Service of Roxbury being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, certainly I'm interested. And I do think, again, like, you know, speed for service is a, it's been a, you know, a growing, sort of, you know, field, and then you have like a lot of people like propagating um, mental health. Everyone says, you know, we need mental health services. Everyone says that in campaigns or, you know, whatever, um, in, in advocating for a thing. But I think that we need more, in, in, in the process of destigmatizing, we need to look at everyone in that sense. So like the police need mental health services. Our teachers need mental health services, right? Mm -hmm. Um, our politicians need mental health services. So I think that in, 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 in the spirit of stigmatizing, but also extending it through institutions so that providers are also taking care of themselves and leading by example. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my, my question is, so many families, so many parents have reached out to our office or just me personally and you know, they don't know how to help their children. They feel like through this pandemic, they're, it's a different child to them and they just feel so helpless. And I know some of you already have touched on it a little, but how do you help them, right? Because they're, the way they parented their child two, three years ago is different from what they're trying to do now. And what can we do as a council? What do you think we could do to support you in that work that you're already doing? So I'd love to hear from all of you on that question. Want to start? Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Um, that's a very good question. I think we struggle with that. Um, I think the needs are so great. So we, it says again, we need more clinicians. We need more funding because we need to do a parent group in addition to working with the children. At South Cove, we have a year-long wait to see our ch see our youth. We can't wait that long, but we just don't have the capacity, the time, and we have, we're covering um, multiple locations. And we're just one organization that's dealing with the shortage of providers. What I would like to see is psychoeducation, if we can bring parents together um, so that they can learn from each other, so they're not alone. So we try to run parent trainings, and I think we need more of that. Um, but then it happens at childcare. Ray, or now it, is it on Zoom or in person? So I think that there are creative ideas, um, but we need, again, um, support and funding childcare so that we can bring these families together and start talking. Awesome, thank you. Shella? Oh my, I think one of the most important things we can do for our parents in Boston right now and around Massachusetts is to normalize how hard this is and how hard it is to access care. You started this hearing with, this is about access and capacity when we know there's massive shortages. Um, and we haven't touched on the ED boarding crisis in our emergency rooms around the city. Um, it is really hard to get high quality mental health care. I think one thing we should really pay attention to is that who is actually getting the care and who isn't. And we know that many low income families of color are least likely to get mental health care on top of this other crisis as well. Um, I know that you're asking me for a solution, not to call out the problems, but I think if parents don't know that the system is broken and fragmented and they're trying to navigate it, they get very um, worn down, they get exhausted, and they feel like it's their, their problem alone when many families cannot get connected to a provider, cannot get, get connected to care. But I think, you know, my feeling about this is first to normalize that it's hard to access providers and care right now. And there's a number of different ways you can do referrals in our, in our city and state, like through your health provider um, as well. But I also think like the power of church and community and a lot of these other nonprofits that are supporting families each and every day, like where is our support networks? It's not always about a therapist. I don't think that's always the solution, but really being more holistic about, you know, there's been a whole lot of talk about what we're doing for our bodies and our minds. It's hard to do that when you're in crisis but to sort of think about who are your natural supports. I always am encouraged parents to talk to other parents in their community because once you say, my kid is struggling, 
usually then it's like an echo of me too, yeah. right? And parents often feel like they're in isolation and I think this goes back to the stigma conversation earlier. There is no magic answer here. We don't have enough care. I do think, I would. I, I hope to see more robust services. Um, I am a professor of social work at two graduate schools. I'm seeing my classrooms are full. I'm excited about what's coming, but we don't have enough. And I think as a state, when we're a leader in education, when we're a leader in all of these things, um, and I think maybe that's why I'm so passionate about what we can actually do in the school building during the day, because that's where kids are, and sort of how do we start to do more parent communication, do more groups um, as well, but. Thank you. Yes. Todd? Yes, thank you. Please. Um, I, my, my mic is on? Yep, you're okay, on. Okay, great, thank, thank you. you. Um, what can we do, you know, um, what I know that we try and we strive to do at, uh, at, at my program is we need to get parents and children together. Um, and so we do have, quote unquote, the Sunday afternoon meal. Um, and that meal, in the sense of the metaphor for having parents and children sit down together as part of their therapy. And it's not called therapy, it's called let's getting together and communicating with what's going on individually and as a family. So those parents get two things. One is they get to spend time with their children that's not based on discipline or based on um, um, trying to reform their child in some way. And the kids get a chance to sit down with their parents and sort of speak a little bit about what's going on for them and what they would like to see different. So that is real important part of the quote unquote therapy. And so hopefully that is modeled after we have left that family that they can continue to have, if not, on Sunday afternoons, but on a regular basis to sort of meet together, talk about what's going on for them individually and talk about what their concerns are for the family. And they can hear each other. That is so important when you talk about what can you do is to help that be modeled in, in, in all families. And it was really sad to hear about some families, particularly immigrant families, whose, fam whose parents come from a very difficult and trying uh, uh, culture or, or, or state and not being able to share that mm -hmm. with their children and their children find out years and years later. Well, we know that that is something that happens within multicultural families or multilinguistic families or cultures, immigrant families. So we definitely put that as part of our quote unquote treatment plan is to have those stories being told. And one of the ways that we do that is through genograms so that you know how you're connected through generations and how those impact you today. So there are specific things that you can do, and I think that it's very important that it's, it's done. And of course, there's always, you know, how do you get the resources, and you know, can you do more of it, et cetera, et cetera, and we're always working on those issues as well. I appreciate that. Erin, if you would like to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to add on, um, to what other folks have said, another thing that I think has worked really well for us on a really small scale that I'd love to see expanded is um, thinking about compensating young people and also parents, people of all ages, for their their time engaging in these programs. So we have community-based peace circles, for example, and there's um, that youth employment through the peer-to-peer -peer program with the EAST Coalition, the Substance Use Support Coalition. So young people are compensated for their time at the peace circles. And we also have gift cards that we give to community members of all ages for attending. Um, just as a, a small example and thinking about more ways to bridge that gap between community resource, assess, uh, community resource needs and um, you know, basic needs. So thinking about how to, um, to support folks who are struggling with affording food and rent and that intersection with mental health. So small ways that it's possible to um, bridge that gap so people don't have to be choosing between attending this um, this meeting and um, working or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I um, appreciate this panel. Thank you very much. We are going to, I hope you can stay. We're going to the nonprofit panel. Thank you all for waiting. Um.
So if Kevon Barton from Youth Connect, Toy Burton from Dee's Cry, you can make your way up and we can sit in any chair up here. Michael Dowling from Spoke, Nicolette Longo from Namaste Sober, and I know we will have Andrea and Pete virtually from the Boys and Girls Club of Roxbury join us, and also Tina Cherry from the Peace Institute and also the Phoenix. And we can sit at the end tape chairs too if we need to. Thank you. Yep. You can sit there and we can also, you can sit at the ends here if all four seats are taken. Yep, sit there, thank you. And thank you for waiting. I hope the first two panels were helpful, informative, yes. yes. This is great, so. Like we had said with the um, first two panels, when, we, when I call on you, if you could state your name and your organization, and then we will give everyone five minutes to share. I think that's fair, because we have more than, if I just said 20, people would might get 30 seconds and not the full time. So, and what you have to share with us is very important. So thank you very much. If um, we will start is if I'm with Kevin Barton from Youth Connect. Awesome, thank you. Not sure if this is, okay. Yep, it will start. Yeah, yeah so thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting. It was, it was wonderful to hear everyone before us. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible, but anyone that has sat with me one-on-one -on -one knows I like to tell a story now, right, Counselor? Um, so, again, my name is Kevin Barton. I'm the Executive Director of Youth Connect, um, a violence prevention, intervention, and advocacy program of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston in partnership with the Boston Police. I um, want to thank you for, for actually bringing this to the forefront, you know, the, the youth mental health crisis, uh, really thinking about how we as a city and a community can really continue to do this, this work. Uh, it really is crucial that more resources are made available to address mental health needs of our young people, uh, and I'm glad we're talking about it. So for the last 25 years at Youth Connect, we've placed licensed clinical social workers in police stations all throughout Boston. Uh, our social workers provide holistic community-based mental health services to young people between the ages of 10 to 24 who officers are really concerned about. So these are young people who are interfacing with our uh, police, with our officers, who have either you know, been arrested for, for any number of, of things, from weapons to um, you know, uh, trespassing. Uh, it could be for anything, really, exploitation, et cetera. And so we're embedded within six police stations and three citywide units. And we offer comprehensive assessments uh, psychoeducation, referrals to other service providers, uh, clinical case management, uh, crisis and stabilization supports, as well as individual and family therapy. Youth Connect is free. We're not reliant on any insurance. Um, you know, and we, we do the fundraising to, to make sure we remain free so it is truly accessible. Uh, we are voluntary and we are confidential. And we can do the work with no time limits because we are not bound by the constraints, I think, of, of insurance managed care. Uh, when at full capacity, we work with over 800 young people and their families every year. So while the pandemic has been challenging, I, I think it's fair to say for everyone, um, it has been and continues to be hardest on our, our most vulnerable populations in Boston. Uh, the youth and families that our team work with are some of the most vulnerable in our city, um, often marginalized or underserved uh, or disengaged. These are young people who are often involved with the juvenile justice system, uh, families with generational trauma and families living in, in, in poverty. Um, and they've been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, as we know. Um, aside from the trauma of losing loved ones, uh, our families have experienced financial burdens due to loss of jobs, either because they were fired. Somebody who was maybe working 30 hours all of a sudden had their hours cut to six for the week and trying to raise a family on that is next to impossible. Or some families had to really choose between work and being at home to care for their children who were not able to be in school. 
the, the safety nets for our children and our youth were really disrupted. Um, what was familiar to them was really no longer reliable. And truthfully, many of our young people were asked to remain home in what were sometimes unsafe situations for our young people. So situations where domestic violence and child abuse was and is prevalent. But we ask that of our young people. The social emotional toll has been truly disheartening. Um, the isolation, the trauma, the stress, all exacerbated mental health symptoms that for many of our young people were already present. So anxiety and depression, suicidal ideation. And as we've opened back up, we see that families are still struggling to even meet their basic needs because of the secondary issues that have arisen as a result of the pandemic. All of a sudden, there's rising costs of everything. I went to a gas station today, and it was almost $5. It's like, how is somebody going to do that? Or the rents. And yet, salaries haven't really risen at that same rate, if at all. So I started to ask myself, so how is this actually showing up then for our young people, this mental health crisis? For many of our youth, um, it really has manifested in more risky behaviors. Um, I'm sure everyone here has recently heard about the numerous incidents of assaults, weapons, fights, and young people have been in the middle of it. Our youth don't feel safe, they don't feel grounded, they don't feel seen or understood, and I think they're finding ways to communicate that to us, the adults, who are charged with caring for them. I think they're often acting out their fears and their disconnect and their trauma. And what we noticed was that their clinical needs are, are not really being met due to exorbitant wait lists, right? And I, I think some of our colleagues uh, around the table before were speaking to that. Um, there are long wait lists. I believe one person said almost a year wait for a young person to be seen or to even be able to get a psychiatric evaluation. And then you talk about young people who need even higher levels of care, like CBAT, STARS, residential programs, hospital placements. They end up in these holding patterns, patterns where the care is still within the community. And for some of our young people, it may be that they're being held in detention because that is going to be the safest place for them. But we know that there is a lot that happens there. Right? So what are we saying? And many of the waits are due to you know, shortages, I think, in staffing. Uh, most of us around the table haven't been immune to that, right? losing staff. But what this means then is that systems like DCF, DYS, probation, BPD, BPS, you name it, they're overstretched. And all of us who provide the services on the ground, those of us who are, are sitting here at this table, I think we're overstretched at times, oftentimes, <laughs> let's be real. Um, and we're often having to find creative ways because we are resilient and we are creative and innovative in thinking about these creative ways to help stabilize young people until those wait lists shorten just a little, but all while being underfunded and understaffed. So from a positive youth development perspective, I, I think we know that there are several truths that really have to be embedded with any efforts that we, we, we do to address the crisis. Um, and it really is a framework that's at the heart of, of what we do at Youth Connect, and I think so many of us around the table here. I think first and foremost, you know, we, we do ground ourselves in, we are not the experts in the lives of our young people. We're just not. Whether we look like you or we come from whatever background, we're still not the expert in, right? And so we have to listen to our young people and families. Um, I think efforts need to be flexible and creative. There is, we talked about this, there's a stigma around accessing mental health services. There shouldn't be, but we've created that, that stigma, right? And so we know that for many of our BIPOC youth, um, especially young men, I think, are not gonna walk into your traditional mental health settings. Many of them won't. Not just because it feels inaccessible or there are limited services, because, but because there is the stigma. So one of the things that we do, and I think all of us do, is we tend to break down the barrier to that stigma. We bring the therapy to them, right? 
Uh, we truly are meeting young people where we're at. We, we often talk about meeting, meeting someone where they're at, right, in the textbook, right? But the truth is we do, we do that every day, right? So we may be meeting with families or in their homes, we may be meeting with a young person in school, detention, jails, pains me to say that, or the park, or even just in our car. And doing so can help folks feel like it's less intense. And the truth is we don't even have to call it therapy. All of us are licensed clinical social workers at Youth Connect, we all can do therapy, we all do therapy. But if you don't want to call it that, I'm just Kevin, right? And we really, you know, uh, my team of just dedicated social workers, what we do every day is help young people talk about what's going on. And if you can't talk about it, can you write it? Can you draw it? Can you wrap it? Whatever you need, we'll be there to listen. We also know that different therapeutic modalities are needed. And someone spoke about that in, in, in the previous panel and, and a true believer in this. You know, um, the way you engage young people is the way you engage young people, right? Whatever works. And for many of our young people, it's sports, it's music, it's art, it's dance, right? Creative writing, you name it. We also know that building caring relationships works, right? but it takes time and trust. And in any effort that we do and with any funding that comes out, it needs to recognize this and invest in programs that have a history of supporting young people over the long haul, like many of us here at the table, but certainly at Youth Connect and Boys and Girls Clubs of Boston. And we need to make it a priority to provide free access to mental health supports. I love what you know uh, Councilor Anderson said about the three months in, in Mass Health. Um, I think it's gonna take a federal federal thing too to, to kind of get on track with that. But you know, one of the things that I am very um, proud of is the fact that we don't charge and we don't bill. So we can do this in the long haul. If you need to work together for a year, you got it. Two years, okay, whatever it takes. We know that also youth don't grow up in isolation, right? We know this from positive youth development, right? They grow up in the context of families and schools and community, and so we have to leverage and build strong, consistent partnerships with the team working alongside the family that doesn't duplicate services, because then a lot of this happens, and I think uh, Councilor Mejia spoke to that, you know, a lot of this, right? So one of the things that we like to do is to really work with our partners, um, and we work with so many, um, and, and our, you know, collaborate and really trying to coordinate services so, so we know what we need to do based on what a family is telling us that they need. Okay. So more than ever, I, I think we do need more funding to increase non-traditional methods. We know work and add to our capacity to do what we do. You know, and it, it is multifaceted, right? Whether it's safe havens and home away from homes, you know, like the clubs provide or community centers or any of the number of, you know, medicine wheel, wherever it is, you know, or like at Youth Connect, where it's providing social workers who catch young people who aren't going to engage in school, and we're trying to help them get there, right? Or in after school programs, or they're not going to walk into the traditional mental health setting. Um, and we also need to address the other needs that are there for families. If we're asking our young people to feel safe and to feel heard, then we also need to know that they can't go to bed hungry. We know that they need to be able to have access to health care, right? right? Because if we're, if we're not able to do those things for our young people, then the depression, the anxiety remains because the message is you don't matter, right? Even though we know that's not true. So Boston, I think, has a, long, has a history of, of being, um, I think, a leader and an innovator on many fronts. Um, but I am hopeful that we can get this right as a city. Um, and we can invest more funding in programs like all of us nonprofits here that uh, really allows us to increase our efforts to serve our most vulnerable young people. And so they're not really falling through the cracks of, of our systems that we know need, need to be, need some help. So, thank you, I appreciate the time. No, thank you, thank you. Um, Toy Burton, if you could go please. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me here to um, talk about DD Squad and the work that we do. Thank you, Councilor Mahia. Thank you. 
So my name is Toy Burton. I am the founder and executive director of Dee Dee's Cry Suicide Prevention and Family Support and also the founder and executive director of the Roxbury Unity Parade. Dee Dee's Cry is named after my sister, Danita Shea Morris, who died by suicide when she was 23 in 1986. But I started Dee Dee's Cry in 2017 after I noticed that organizations that focus on suicide prevention and mental health education really wasn't coming into Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan. To me, communities of color, so I decided to start something to connect the community to the resources. Now, I am not a clinician. Um, I am not in that field. I just felt like my community needed something, and so I decided to build that. And right now, Didi's Cry is currently working with the Boston Public Health Commission and the Samaritans to form a loss team, loss, L-O-S-S, which is local outreach to suicide survivors. A loss team provides support to families after losing a loved one to suicide. A loss team is suicide prevention and post-prevention support. Didi's Cry Suicide Prevention and Family Support believes that addressing mental health and providing support is suicide prevention. Being a preschool teacher and through the work of Didi's Cry during the pandemic, I saw firsthand how the pandemic affected children and their families. We know that stresses in the home also affect children's mental well-being, whether it's food insecurity or housing instability. Through the funding from the Boston Resiliency Fund, Didi's Cry provided direct support to families in our community facing hardships. Once the funding ended, so did that support. During the pandemic, Didi's Cry had a virtual program that taught parents how to support their child's social and emotional growth and development and gave parents the strategies and resources to do that. Um, once the funding ended, so did that support. We know, and just to reiterate what um, Councillor Murphy was saying before, and to paraphrase, to paraphrase, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to take an alarming toll on our children's mental health. We must ensure that every child has access to culturally competent mental health care and supports. We must put supports in place for our children and our schools and community that foster our children's mental well-being. Dee Dee's Cry hopes to receive funding to bring our healing begins with me support group model into our schools to give children the peer support they need. Dee Dee's Cry services are also free. Dee Dee Cry believes that cost is a barrier to seeking and receiving help. We must sustain funding for effective mental health care and address the economic and social barriers that contribute to the lack of mental health support for our young people. And we must also increase funding for the mental health screen and diagnosis and treatment, particularly for underprivileged populations and strengthen suicide prevention programs in our schools, primary care and community response teams like the LOSS team. We must first fund organizations like Dee Dee's Cry that are meeting families where they're at and make sure that our children have the resources to thrive and not just survive. And um, just to um, magnify what um, Councilor Mejia said about um, people with lived experience. So I am also a suicide attempt survivor. I am also... Um, I've been clean for almost 24 years, clean and sober. So I know what it's like to um, self, thank you, what it's like to self-medicate. Um, and our community does that well too. We self-medicate because the resources are not there. So we turn to drugs and alcohol to help us deal with the pains and the traumas that we are going through or that we went through. So even with the Dee Dee's Cry Begins With Me support group, um, and we call it Healing Begins With Me, because even though we are not to blame for our pain, it is our responsibility to begin that healing process. So even though I did send um, the counselors the, um, the Healing Begins With Me overview mm -hmm. and stuff, 
And it does say the purpose of this group is to provide high school students with a safe and non-judgmental space to be heard and connect with peers and build relationships, support, and resources. Not only is this model good for um, high school students, it is good for educators. It is good for the city council. It is good for parents. Um, this model can be used and tweaked to fit the community that it needs to provide the help with. So Didi's Cry, um, when I started Didi's Cry almost five years ago, um, everything was just out of pocket. Like I said, I just felt the need and, and just provided that need. If it was not for the pandemic, Didi's Cry would have never received funding. I apply for grants and I get no's all the time saying mental health is not in their, their um, catchment, you know, of the, of what they support. Like they support health, but not mental health. Um, and because of the pandemic, the one thing that came, not the one thing, but a good thing that came from it is that, that we are focused on mental health now. You know, there's a lot of organizations that has a role because of the pandemic to address mental health. But Didi's Cry's been there. We've been wanting to, um, provide the support to prevent suicide. So Didi's Cry is asking that the city council put in funding, provide us with the $300,000 that we need to do this work. We are a three person team supporting our community. We need the funds that we can hire more to help um, bring Didi's Cry's potential to reach and support more of the communities in Boston. So we ask that the city partner with Didi's Cry and help us support our community the best way possible. Thank, Thank you. I appreciate that. <coughs> um, next is Spoke, Michael Dowling. And we start, yeah, thank you. Oh, and before you start, I do want to mention that we have been joined by Councilor Louis Jean, thank you for coming. She's going to join you over there. She's a boss. Okay. <laughs> Almost. Yep, I, if you start talking, it will start. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. This has been, for me, uh, very emotional. I'm a little bit overwhelmed by uh, everyone's comments today. And, you know, I have a lot of what Kevin said about connects on the back of this sheet, right? Um, which I was gonna say, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bore everyone now with, you know, the urgency of this work. I think Kevin was very articulate in, in what we all try to do in the nonprofit sector, right? And, uh, and we are, you know, desperately underfunded as, <laughs> as, uh, as my colleagues are saying. But on the front of the sheet, and I'll pass it out, there's a mosaic of a young man uh, in early recovery from opiate addiction. And there is a QR code that you can hear his story. And he'll, he'll tell his story much better than I can, uh, believe me. So I'll leave this with people as we leave, and then you can read more about our organization. But one of the things that really struck me today was, <clears throat> you know, when I was born, this is not going to be my whole life story, but when I was born, you know, the, the doctor didn't uh, present me to my parents and say, congratulations, you have a gay son. Right? Because the expectations, of course, were that I would be, quote, normal, straight. And, and you know, we're born with expectations. You know, they're, they're not a birthright. They're put on us at a very early age. And I have found in you know, my 30 years of working with young people that we, they live up to or down to our expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have an expectation that you will fail, that you will let me down, that you will disappoint me, you do those things for me. And that somehow satisfies something in that power structure or that disconnection. And that, you know, that's very, very disturbing. You know, we all have a story. I tell this all the time, you know, I have a story. You know, we in this room now have a story, right? It's a shared story. 
And I think, you know, we're also part of the story, the story of merely being, right? Of being fragile, of being strong, right? Of being joyful, of being sad, you know, the human condition, right? And, you know, mental health is part of the human condition. It can't be measured in the same way that intelligence cannot be measured. Our gifts cannot be measured. And yet the professionals often tell us these are the measurements, these are the metrics. We worked on a really beautiful project at one point with four colleagues uh, that I was like out of my mind thrilled to work with High Square Task Force, the Theater Offensive, Raw Arts, and Zoomix, right? You know, sort of in that creative youth development field, I said, We're, what? I don't belong here. <laughs> and, um, but we did a survey, a youth survey, and this was the most telling thing to me. Um, there's two parts of this story. You know, my young people were very disturbed because the uh, education piece, uh, you know, had finished high school, you know, blah, 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 or dropped out, right? And my young people said, you know, that's, we didn't drop out, life happened. Mm -hmm. You know, I came home and my mother was shooting up. I had to get my brother out of prison. You know, the stories that we all know, the stories of our lives. And so they changed the language of that to, you know, I left school because of circumstances beyond and out of my control. And, but funders don't like to hear that. They like to hear, I went to college. They want to hear, I got a great job. When we did a survey of over 70, I think it was seven, almost 7,000 young people, right? We had a, a return rate, a phenomenal return rate, and asked what they had found or what the best thing about being at Medicine Wheel was, was that after five years, they were alive, right? And not that we saved their lives, but they had found a voice and they had found their story and they had found their courage to live. And that, that kind of haunts me because, you know, I've taken artwork to many young people's funerals, right? And given it to their parents and always in that artwork is this glimpse of, of the real person the untold story of that young person. And the parents always appreciate getting that message, really sometimes beyond the grave, right? But knowing that, you know, their kid wanted to live, the kid wanted to get better, the kid was struggling, right? I think one of the things I've heard today, again, that is that, you know, children, young people and parents have given up their, they are the experts, right? And the expectation that the experts will come in and fix us is just wrong. And, and we've given our power over oftentimes to these experts who are supposed to come in with the fix. And, and you, because of that, oftentimes that disconnection between our story and the story is broken, right? And so we stay stuck in a place that we can't break out of. We used to call it in South Boston, where I've done a lot of youth work, the Southie milkshake. It involved suicide, heroin, death. Suicide, heroin, death, right? No way to break free of that. And when, you know, this, I'll end with this, but you know, when I first started this youth work, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Raymond. Uh, when I first started this youth work, a young man said to me, and he, we worked with 17 young people that year, and uh, he said to me, you know, Mike, nobody ever shows us what to do. Nobody ever listens to our story. And these were kids who wanted to build a, a, a memorial space for victims of overdose and suicide. And they said, we've gone to the church. They said, no. We've gone to the city. They say, no. We've gone to our families. They say, no. We don't want to romanticize suicide. We don't want to think that, oh, if you kill yourself, you'll get a monument. You know, I had been working, um, our work at Medicine Will began in a pandemic. 
we responded to the HIV crisis. And, you know, one in four men of my generation died in Boston during that time. So I experienced very much what these young people were, were experiencing with their young friends suddenly dying. And I created a gathering place that now we've done, done for 30 years uh, called on World AIDS Day, Day Without Art, for people to gather around grief and, memory, and remembrance. But the shame and the stigma that were associated with AIDS, very similar to that with opiate addictions, very similar with gun violence, very similar with um, suicide, that people don't want to talk about those being the issues. And so I realized out of that work that these young people only wanted to create a place to grieve, a place that could hold their grief, a place where they could honor their loss, a place where they could name their story. Right? And so we built on the side of a hill in South Boston a Celtic cross, and the families came and, uh, uh, to gather around that for many, many years. And now that same site has employed thousands of young people over the last 25 years in a summer youth employment program. And because of our work, you know, in those early years around pandemics, because I think, you know, we're in multiple pandemics. We're not just in the mental health pandemic within the COVID pandemic. We're in a gun violence, addiction, suicide, racist, you know, we're in pandemics that are unbelievable. But because of that work, we've had a lot of invitations, one by Boston Police Department, in our hand-in-hand -hand project, pairing young people with police officers across the city in a series of creative dialogues. Uh, and the other, in the most recent one, we're also going to pass to Raymond. Right now, I promise, because I do go on. I'm worse than Kevin. <laughs> but I love listening to Kevin. Um, is um, a contract with the Mass Department of Public Health right, to really look at the needs of homelessness, LGBTQ plus youth, and youth of color. Raymond. Okay. Raymond. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Raymond Rodriguez, and I represent the Latinx Wellness Center. Um, it was created um, as a result of not having anything Latinx in our city of our own, pretty much. Um, I come from the era of Latino Health Institute and the Centro Hispano of Chelsea. I grew up at Cathedral Projects in Boston, and um, I'm an LGBTQ man who normalizes mental health. I recently, as far as three weeks ago, lost my job because of a lapse. And I normalize that. I speak about it on social media. It's okay to speak, and I want our youth and young adults to speak about it. We recently got a grant um, to, through visas to work with youth and create digital content to speak about these same issues that I'm speaking now, HIV AIDS, the interse intersectionality of public health work, AIDS, HIV, stigma, PrEP, all the new stuff in conjunction with homelessness, um, substance use, not just concentrated on the opioid crisis, but on the drug crisis, mm -hmm. crystal meth, crystal meth and all um, the um, stimulant use disorder. It's and just normalizing and speaking about it, um, creating positions and, and bringing funding for case management work in the field. Um, so that's how we got connected to work together. Um, besides of doing the Latinx Wellness Conference, which we did for two years in the city, um, working with Latinx and um, a transgender community, and also with uh, indigenous Latinx community. Thank you. Thank you for being here also. Nicoletta. Um, so yeah, I just want to be cognizant of everybody's time and I feel like a lot of the similar things that everybody's spoken about, um, especially you, um, I can relate to in regards to uh, Namaste Sober. So I'm the founder of Namaste Sober. I'm also a meditation instructor and um, we started Namaste Sober back in 2015. I lost one of um, my very close friends to an opiate overdose and I uh, was always trying to get him to come to yoga with me and he was like, no, I don't have the clothes and I don't know, you know, the moves and I don't speak whatever language they're speaking in there. So, um, you know, there was a lot of different hurdles aside from just like financial accessibility for him to be able to uh, come to class. So he never made it. And 
as a result, after he passed away, we held a fundraiser for him and all the money that we raised, we decided to donate just uh, to people that are, were in recovery, five people to get a year long scholarship to yoga. And then after that year, uh, sorry, I'm like, it's been an emotional day for me. Um, actually, I'm just gonna take one second. Like breathing, meditation are so important. Um, so out of those five people, four of them were sober at the end of the year. Um, and then two of them went on to become yoga instructors uh, and actually ended up opening their own yoga studios. So the whole, you know, fr from where we were in 2015 to now, now we partner with studios all around the city, already existing studios, and our whole goal is to make their offerings and classes and workshops and teacher trainings uh, more accessible for people that are in any type of recovery. Um, obviously, the pandemic was very challenging for us overnight. Uh, all 17 studio partners uh, closed, and we were kind of like, we don't really know what to do. So um, we started teaching online classes, community conversations that focus on meditation, mindfulness, context uh, awareness. And we thought they were gonna last for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, and that soon turned into um, now going on like two years of us leading those classes. So, um, you know, I think one of the reasons why I'm emotional right now is I, you know, I know that our programming works and it's just been very frustrating um, to kind of be in this startup phase for so long. You know, um, the, sorry, it's okay. Take your time. Um, you know, a lot of our, a lot of the instructors that, um, you know, four instructors specifically that started the pandemic teaching meditation from home have s since relapsed. Two of them currently live on mass and gas. And, um, you know, the thing about yoga and meditation is it just really works. And we have uh, different systems that we've created over the years. Um, one of them being that we have a host at every studio. So when new members go to studios, they meet the host and they take the first class. And, you know, I think that's a really important piece to see someone that like was where they were and to take the class and be like, here's where the mat is. And yeah, I don't know, you know, that Sanskrit word that they said either, you, you know, and um, the way that we communicate is we set up Slack channels for each of our studios. So um, the members are able to communicate to each other, to the hosts, and then we also have ambassadors that are instructors in the studios so people feel like they can identify with the instructors um, and maybe even see like a future career path for themselves. So uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for having me. I'm really grateful just to be here. Um, one of our first big events was actually at City Hall in 2016. We did a fitness festival here. So. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Tina. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I'm struggling. Being in this space re-triggers me and re-traumatizes me because I've been at this since 1994. Yet, I'm here because I am committed to my beloved city. I am Chaplain Clementina Sherry, founder of the Lewis B. Brown Peace Institute. And on behalf of my entire team at the Peace Institute, we thank you, Chair Council Murphy, for allowing us to speak today. And to all the city councils, whether you're here or not, we express our appreciation for your service and partnership as we work to foster peace in the city of Boston. The work of the Peace Institute began in 1993 after my 15-year-old son, Lewis, was caught in a fatal crossfire on his way to a teen against gang violence 
Christmas party meeting near our home in Dorchester. I left the hospital empty-handed, both literally and within my soul. No family deserves to be without guidance at such an awful time. Yet, once people realized that Lewis was a good kid with good grades and not in any kind of trouble, support began to flood in. This exposed the painful reality that the city of Boston did indeed have the resources for families of murdered victims, but only if the victim was deed worthy. As families who experience the pain of having to bury our loved ones to homicide deserve to be wrapped in love, compassion, and support, regardless of the circumstances. This is the only way we can heal as a community. Since 1996, the Peace Institute has provided that services to families all across this great city. And to this day, near in three decades later, we continue to serve the city of Boston by being the lead coordinator in our city's homicide response. Notice I did not say trauma response, homicide response. Families at the Peace Institute during their life worst moments are met with guidance, empathy, and choice. We offer burial support, safe emergency housing, essentials such as food and clothing, financial assistance, mental health support, case management, healing groups, and workshops, and so much more. Survivors of homicide victims of all ages who come through our doors believe in a comprehensive toolkit to sustain them in their healing process after they bury their loved ones. The same goes for the providers who play an essential role in our homicide response. We are the connector that pulls together government agencies, organizations, and providers across the city to offer coordinated and thorough response when a homicide happens, including those who were killed due to police involved shootings. We offer training to law enforcement, EMS, hospital, mental health organization, government agencies, and other providers and first responders on best practices when offering survivor centered and trauma informed care in the aftermath of a homicide. The Peace Institute coordinates the city, the state providers network to avoid duplication of services and to ensure that the needs of survivors of homicide victims are met comprehensively and sustainably. We have turned our experience and learning over the past 28 years into systems, toolkits, and a connect collection of clinically sound test best practices for homicide response. The Peace Institute is asked to share our knowledge around the country and internationally, yet it remains a challenge to secure the resources that will sustain us to meet the basic needs of families when a homicide happens. The partnership between the Peace Institute and the City of Boston serves as a model to the nation of how local government and community can collaborate in responding to murder, trauma, grief, and loss. To further this work and to meet the needs of growing survivor community, we call upon the Boston City Council to commit to partnering, true partnering, with the Peace Institute with a four-year commitment of $800,000 in discussion with members of the City Council and through assessment and service planning, we have determined that these resources will help us appropriately meet the needs of families of murdered victims in the city. Murder is still happening. Suicide is still happening. Overdose is still happening. It is still happening. And when it does, this is where the city calls to make sure the families can bury their loved ones with dignity and compassion. 
We hope that the city council will act to meet the needs of their constituents, the survivors, and commit to the cause for peace in our city by supporting this request. I just want to share some data. Again, I said I've been at this since 1994, and then I'll end. 1996 is a 26-page report, Youth Violence, a Community-Based Response, One City Success Story. I don't know if those of you remember when Janet Reno was here, our Attorney General. Section 5, Prevention-Oriented School-Based Program. On E, on page 19, the Lewis D. Brown Peace Curriculum was one of the programs that our Attorney General cited that contributed to the reduction of juvenile crime in the city of Boston. This is before social-emotional learning became a thing. 2010, report family voices, strengthening homicide response and family support in the city of Boston. A report to members of the Boston City Council from um, Ayanna Presley, uh, on page five, there's some conclusion. 2011, City of Boston National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention. Youth Violence Prevention and Reduction, a comprehensive city plan. We're on page 29, citing our work. 2016, testimony and recommendations to the Boston City Council's committee hearing on the Boston Public Health Commission's Trauma and Recovery Center. We offer some clear guidance recommendation on what to do with the entire city of Boston. 2020 report to Mayor Walsh with partnership updates on 10 action items the mayor wanted in the city of Boston. We gave him that report. And now we're back here again with a new mayor, with a new body of city council. We are committed to this city. We are committed to our young people. I am giving you guys resources. I know we presented to you, you have all of that. I hope you will join us for our annual Mother's Day Walk for Peace. And we wanna partner with this city council. We wanna partner with you. Bring us on to city hall. I am not a licensed clinician. I don't have a PhD. Yet, my young son wondered why adults were always blaming young people when violence happened. And when things go good, every politician, every church, every member, everybody is taking credit. Mm -hmm. He couldn't understand that. And in his death, in his tragic death, his message of peace and healing will continue. So I am here, I am committed. I would love to work with this city council body to create a peace play and urban setting on City Hall Plaza, where we can bring our community together to really show what the peace of the city looks like. So I will close. If any of you want these, they're stacks, so I know I don't want to kill any trees, I would love to send these reports and recommendations to you guys so that you can see the city has done plan after plan after plan after plan after plan. And we're still here 29 years later, still looking for plan. So thank you so much to my colleagues. We are here, we know we are committed and we just gotta keep on keeping on to make sure that we do not continue to blame the children. I have three grandchildren. I don't wanna be here 25 years later still talking about the youth. So God bless. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least at all, the Phoenix. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Murphy and the Committee on Public Health, Homelessness and Recovery for bringing the topic of children's mental health to the table. I appreciate the city councilors uh, for their time and thoughtfulness in determining the priorities of the city that will be addressed through critical funding. And I'm very grateful for all of the panelists today and everyone who shared. Uh, my name is Maddie Lee. I am a social worker by training and now I'm the engagement manager at the Phoenix. The Phoenix is a nonprofit organization that provides free fitness and social activities in a fun, sober, peer-driven environment. Our mission is to build a sober, active community that fuels resilience and harnesses the transformational power of connection 
so that together we rise, recover, and live. All of our programming is free, and the only requirement is 48 hours of sobriety. With over 500,000 Massachusetts residents living with substance use disorder, we're on a mission to help as many people as we can. The Phoenix is creating a movement so strong that people are drawn in and want to be part of a supportive, sober community filled with life. We're building a vibrant community of people in recovery with support, hope, and resilience. Resilience from the trauma, isolation, and uncertainty that so often fuel substance use disorder. The last national survey on drug use, health, and treatment services, which was released prior to the pandemic, so we know this has gone up, showed that youth aged 12 to 17 in Massachusetts used alcohol for the first time in their lives at a higher rate than both the regional average and the national averages. There is no doubt that throughout the pandemic, the increased stress and isolation for children has created a dire situation for children's mental health. We know that the pandemic has also increased the number of people who have turned to substances to cope with the trauma of this crisis. If we don't recognize that people need healthy coping alternatives like fitness and social activities that build community, we will continue to see dangerous coping habits and ultimately deadly consequences. It's been widely reported that we just experienced the highest annual overdose fatality rates as a country in the last year. As mentioned in today's docket, local hospitals are reporting that 20% of psychiatric patients coming through the emergency room have never sought mental health services before. We need to provide a safe space for children and families to see that there are healthy alternatives to coping with this crisis, namely community and wellness activities. Before the, before the emergencies arise. We are only starting to see the effects of the mental health crisis caused by COVID. And there is a wave of people who need our support before they are in a place of serious emergency. The Phoenix gladly partners with several city agencies such as the Office of Recovery Services, Boston EMS, Office of Returning Citizens, and Boston Police Department, as well as several youth serving organizations like Soccer Without Borders, Beat the Streets, Three Point Foundation, and several other partners like Namaste Sober, uh, to fill our gym with families, children, and all members of our community who need a space for healing. Submitted in writing today are some highlights of our youth and family programming from last year. We are proud and happy to serve as a resource for members of the community who need healing However, I want to emphasize that nonprofits like the Phoenix and like my fellow panelists are not nice to have extra resources. We're essential and critical partners to serve some of the city's most vulnerable community members. Across the country uh, in the last year, that, or in the last year in Boston, the Phoenix has served over 2,000 people. With this funding from the city, we have an opportunity to transform how we view addiction and mental health issues. So thank you all for your time and attention today. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. And just so my colleagues know, we do have a hearing at 1.30, but um, I'll put the timer on for five minutes, but we will go in the order of Councilor Mejia, Councilor Anderson, and then Councilor Lujan. So you can start, Councilor Mejia. So I feel like I'm with family, right? Um, so Tina and I go way back, and it's so disheartening to know that We've been at this work for so long. You were a keynote speaker when I used to do youth development work back in the day when you first launched the Lewis B. Brown Peace Institute. So that just goes to show the amount of work um, that still needs to happen here in the city. But I'm always encouraged by you and your leadership and how you always show up and hold us accountable. So I'm here for supporting um, the advocacy, both um, the financial investments that the city needs to make in all of your organizations and the work that you're doing, because in many ways you are the true MVPs, right? You're out here living the realities and doing the work and the city needs to honor that and, and pour and support. Um, so just wanna note for the record, I still got three minutes, so we keep looking at me and morphing. Um, <laughs> that, um, that um, you know, I just wanna go on the record and, and stating that in terms of financial investments that I will always, uh, you can always count on my support um, to ensure that we are um, supporting organizations and, uh, and startup organizations, we need to get out of our bureaucracy, right? And create space for people. Um, you know, there was something that you talked about um, in, in South Boston, and it was the South Boston suicides 
and I was working with Michael McDonald back in the day. I don't know if you remember him. Um, <clears throat> and Aaron, you know, you probably do remember the the issue around suicide in, in South Boston, and it was so tied into um, addiction. And I think a lot of these things, as Toy mentioned, are intertwined, right? When people are living in poverty and you know we don't have coping me mechanisms, we turn to whatever is going to get rid of this pain. And I think um, that's why your testimonies here today were so incredibly powerful. And I'm so glad that you brought all of yourselves into this space. Um, and I wouldn't say so much that I have any questions, don't worry. Um, but I just, I, I came here to listen, right? Because I think the questions need to be asked to those, you know, to other folks. <laughs> but the people who are doing the work, I, I already know what you're doing, I see you. Um, and I am so incredibly encouraged by the, the work. Um, and, and the heart work. I always say that this work is not, it's not about hard work, it's heart work. And when you lead with your heart um, and you show up in your true self, it's not about politics. And that's the issue I think and the many reasons why we as a city have not been able to move the needle and we keep going back and forth because the political will to do what is right um, usually is at the cost of whether or not you're gonna make a decision that's gonna be politically correct. And we can't play like that anymore, right? So these times require us to really show up for people and to do the work, the real work. Um, so I'm here for it, so trust that you have my support and whatever that looks like. Know that I'm gonna be walking at the Mother's Day walk. I worked, I worked with you on the 20th anniversary um, walk. I, I've been a, a big supporter since day one. You are my neighbor, Tina. Toy, you know, I talked about my experience at your, one of your conferences was the first time as an elected official that I shared my story publicly. So you created space for me to be able to do that. So thank you. Um, and you all know, like, whatever you need, I'm here. So thank you, that's it. Thank you, Council Mejia. Council Anderson. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and the panelists. Um, so I mean, I, there's a certain process to how things happen in city government, and then there's bureaucracy and red tapes and um, kind of like, you know, shitty technicalities that they use as like, you know, um, as delay tactics. And I think that I'm not, like I, I personally don't agree, right? Um, and I hope you can appreciate my vernacular. It's for the drama, dramatic effect. Um, Sister Tina, I have a picture with you when I was 13. Um, <laughs> you, at the time, used to wear longer hair. Um, and my mom, I think, volunteers for your, I look just like her, Antoinette Cavallo, volunteers for your program. Um, but I remember you being a child and hearing the story and, and not fully understanding, I wasn't a child, but I was a teenager, and not fully understanding the scope of what you, you were going through. But I remember you being really strong and asking myself, why isn't she crying? And then understanding what you, when, when I heard you speak, I started crying at the time. And then I, then I understood. Um, and so now as a mother of black sons, I have an investment. So I tell my constituents all the time in D7, my promises rely on the delivery that I have to um, bring to my own grandmother, to the faces that look like my mother, to my brothers and sister and people in my community that all feel like family, right? Um, so I thank you for your vigor, and for your strength, but I want to respect you. And if I respect you, I want you to, to live and to be able to care for your family and to thrive and to continue to do this in a way that you feel, you feel appreciated by the city of Boston. Um, I am willing to sit with you and help you to lobby and advocate and do anything that I can now that, now that I'm here. Um, Ms. Toy Burton, you know that I have a deep appreciation for you and your work. Um, we've met and I hope I can do more than the little bit that I've been able to so far. I hope that we can connect and I think that we have to become organized in the way that we advocate 
for funding. Um, and I think it's all about access. I hear Councilor Lujan talking about this all the time. The people that have access seem to be the ones that the first, you know, get the first check. So, in the, and I heard you loud and clear, brother, about the stories, you know, in terms of who is, who is considered or deemed um, qualified to get this funding. Um, and we have to flip that. I don't agree that the city of Boston or government should not support nonprofits. I don't agree that we should have like this thing where we're only contracting in with for-profit or whatever. I do understand that there are nonprofits that you know have to be vetted, but these are exemplary programs that have been the backbone. And Kevin, you know we talked for over an hour about your program, and. These are the impactful programs, like the Phoenix program, um, and Ms. Nicoletta, thank you so much for sharing your strength here with us and your vulnerability. Um, I want to do the real work. I want to understand what the heck is going on in the process that we can actually look at, you know, delineating the, the steps, one, two, three, make it simple. Can you help me, can you not? Are you partners, are you not? Are you supporting, are you not? Can we do this together? Do I hold the city by myself? When a friend of mine passed away, sorry, one minute if I, if I, if I may, Madam Chair. When my friend passed away, I contacted your agency the city of Boston, for some reason, there was a huge disconnect to the bureaucratic stuff of getting it. It was your program who buried um, this man for this family. And I didn't know him. I met him one time in the mosque. And he happened to be Cape Verdean, and the wife didn't speak Cre English. And because he was Muslim, one hello, one smile, the next week he died. He got killed. And it was your program that buried this man. It was your program that, con that supported him. And it shouldn't just be that you guys hold on your backs every service and hold the city up for us to sit here and say, thank you so much for what you do. Yeah, yeah. What's, what, how can we deliver in a real way? And I'm willing to help you to advocate, to figure out how can we collaborate with administration or state level and get some money. That's really the bottom line. And I thank you and I appreciate it. And I look forward to connecting with you um, beyond today. Thank you, Council Lujan. Thank you, uh, Councilor Murphy, for holding this hearing. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I apologize that I was so late. Um, and um, I just, when I walked into this room, I could see how heavy it was. Um, and I just thank you all for sharing so much of yourselves and your story. Um, I was already pretty emotionally raw because this morning I was uh, sharing, I was speaking to students who are in a uh, sheltered English immersion class in this life program where um, they've just felt so many life difficulties and are in a special classroom and um, and I just told them to that they should be celebrating themselves because there's, they've, they've spent so much of their lives um, being uprooted, so many of them crossing the border to get here. And we don't honor um, the immigrant experience in terms of the loss that people experience and how hard it is. And so I shared with a story that I, I rarely ever share about my mother, who is a, a church woman, black woman, so church is her therapy, right? And so, but the rare moments in our um, early, you know, not too long ago, she shared with my sisters and I the depression that she experienced when she got here and how she had nowhere to go and nowhere to turn and how um, there's so much loss happening. Um, and I just thank all of you for stepping in the gap of our policy failures where we don't, where we're not meeting people where they are, uh, where we spend all this time in bureaucracy and, and not enough time in the work that we need to do to help people become whole, right? That's what I think about this work as city council. Our job is how do we help people to wholeness? And I'm not going to spend too much time saying what my colleagues have already stated, but um, I'm a new city councilor. Um, as much as I can learn how to pull the levers to support our nonprofits, our groups that are already out there doing the work, um, that's what I will do. Um, I thank, of course, Chaplain Cherry for being here. I thank Toy, uh, Nicoletta for, is that, for sharing your story, Raymond, um, Kevin, I, I didn't grab your name, Michael, um, and of course the folks from Maddie from the Phoenix. Um, this is the work, right? Sometimes like government doesn't always get it right, but you guys are, and you all should be supported in what you do. So. Um, like my colleagues, I commit to making sure that we are using our resources. We are a wealthy city. We have a lot of prosperity. Mm -hmm. 
So when people tell you no, it's usually because they don't want to do something or it's usually a lie. And so um, I commit to sharing the prosperity of the city with you because you are stepping in the gaps of our policy failures. And for that, I salute all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I will go. And we do have two um, people who are on Zoom to speak. And hopefully we can get that done before the 1.30 meeting starts. But thank you to my colleagues. A lot of what you said is what I'm feeling. And thank you all for just showing up. And I lost my son, so I know it's a weird, it's this weird bond mothers have. So, and we know that pain never goes away if it's suicide, overdose, however. And then I all, oh, sorry. Breathe. There's that airplane analogy, right? That we're supposed to put our own mask on first so we can help others. But I know so many of us in this room, we don't because we don't have the time because there's so much need out there. And we hear it from our teachers and the panelists before also. So, you know, my heart is heavy for our children in the city right now. But I'm also full of so much hope because you here and we know there's so many more of you out there in this city. So I also commit to what my colleagues said that we're gonna keep advocating and showing up and yes the administration was here first and then we had the medical field and they're doing wonderful things but we all know that it's the nonprofits who are out there that are the miracle workers that are showing up in a car if that's what you need you talk often Michael about you know everyone has a story and when you say that it always reminds me that we have to let everyone know that they belong our story is never the same, but it doesn't mean we don't all need and want the same thing. So um, I will end on that, and we will go, if they are still here, to Catherine Batali, if she's here. To, oh, public, okay, we're here in person. It's Padma Scott and Catherine Batali. Thank you. Okay, so I first just wanted to say before I start reading what I have prepared, um, I don't appreciate the amount of time that the counselors spend speaking because it's a public hearing and you guys are here to hear the public. I don't know why so much time is allotted to you guys to speak. But um, since the pandemic started in March 2020, politicians and school administrations have gotten far too comfortable intruding on the lives of the people they work for by acting as if they have this newfound authority to make our medical decisions for us. We've seen everything from the extreme torture of our children by forcing them to wear muzzles for six to eight hours a day to the disgusting violations of our bodily autonomy by forcing COVID testing and vaccination to participate in society. What happened to my body, my choice? Most of you advocate for bodily autonomy when it comes to killing babies but when we're talking about medical devices and procedures being forced on us, we no longer reserve the right to make our own choices. We send our children to school to learn academics and to socialize, not to be screened, diagnosed, and treated by medical professionals. That's what clinics and hospitals are for. Why do you want so badly to take away parental rights? Is it a power trip? Do you think you can make better decisions for a child than his or her parent can? It's none of your business what the medical needs are of our children. Our children are suffering at higher rates than ever because you, our government, have been abusing them for the past two years and counting. If you really wanted to see mental health improving our youth, in our youth, you'd be advocating to remove the masks and allow them to hug and high five each other and to sit together to eat lunch. There is nothing you can do to fix all the mistakes you've all made over the past two years, but it all needs to stop now. I know that some of you know who I am by now, and if you haven't noticed, I'm not going away. Boston is my home. I was born and raised in Dorchester, and I'm raising my kids here. You all have ruined and destroyed our city over the past two years, and I refuse to let it continue. Last week, we ran a spontaneous write-in campaign that launched five days before an election, and we garnered 10% of the vote in five days. Put doctors in schools and continue down the path of social-emotional learning, and I will make sure that we have an entire brand-new city council next year. I will campaign and I will educate every single parent in this city on what you are doing to their kids. 
I will continue to be here every week, and I will continue to protest here and at your houses, no matter how many times you put me in jail for doing it. It is my God-given responsibility to, pro to protect my children, and I will do everything in my power to empower every other parent in Boston to do the same. That's all. Thank you. Is there one more? Hi, um, I'm also one of the protesters that have been outside Mayor Wu's house holding signs saying, unmask the kids. It causes psychological trauma. They are being tortured. There have been protesters regularly speaking out against the pandemic restrictions forced on young people in the Boston public schools, and the city councilor and mayor continue to ignore, fail to take appropriate action. On other city council hearings, when members of the public spoke calling masks abusive, they were censored, interrupted, and muted by the city council. Instead of hearing the cries of the concerned adults, the city council intends to turn schools into mental health facilities rather than removing the masks from the kids and allowing them to resume normal social interaction. Stop torturing the kids and leave the parental decisions in the home where they belong. Stop blocking public comment or turning a deaf ear to messages that don't align with your agenda. When you hear from members of the public, remember, you report to us. Boston remains one of the only school systems in the entire state that has yet to unmask the students. There is no emergency, and this cruel science experiment on the children must stop now. The continued masking of kids in the city of Boston are having tragic consequences for those children still enrolled. Luckily, those families who have the means have been pulling their children out in record numbers week after week. Your schools stink. The kids are being academically, and they're being forced to wear them, wear germ cloths on their faces to re and breathe, breathe their CO2, contrary to what God intended for them to breathe. Own up to what you have done. You are harming children with your policies. End the mask mandate, and then let these kids go back to being carefree again. Your policies of masking them feel responsible, feel responsible for protecting adults and beyond cruel and needs to end. Children are not responsible to protect adults. It's a twisted society who thinks so. Children belong to their parents, not the city council or the school system. Stop your intrusion into families and give kids back to their parents to oversee. Stand down, all of you. You are violating our civil and human rights. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. You're and it is 128, and we have finished just in time for the 130 meeting, but I do just want to thank everyone who's here, and I know it's just the beginning of this very important conversation, and we're going to continue to advocate and work together, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.